हे गाइस वेलकम टू आर चैनल कोडज आके वी नो दैट विश्वेश्वरा टेक्नोलॉजिकल यूनिवर्सिटी और वी टी यू इन शॉर्ट हैज़ द सब्जेक्ट सी प्रोग्रामिंग फॉर प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग इन द फर्स्ट ईयर्स करिकुलम फॉर इंजीनियरिंग स्टूडेंट्स देर फो वी आर स्टार्टिंग अ न्यू प्ले लिस्ट ऑन द सेम सब्जेक्ट सो वी विल बी कवरिंग ऑल द फाइव मॉड्यूल्स नाउ वी ऑल्सो हैव अ डेडिकेटेड प्ले लिस्ट ऑन द फिफ्थ सेमेस्टर सब्जेक्ट एप्लीकेशन डेवलपमेंट यूजिंग पाइथन which has received much praise attention and feedback from our viewers and subscribers so we are pretty sure that this playlist is also going to help the students to clarify the doubts and secure good marks in the semester examination and also help them to understand various complex programs which will help them to crack interviews also therefore without any further ado let's start with module 1 and all the best from our entire coders arcade team we will be starting with basic c programming and eventually will be moving on to the complex programs in c programming so here is a brief history about c c is a general purpose programming language it has been closely associated with the unix system where it was developed since both the system and most of the programs that run on it are written in c c is generally called a system programming language because it is useful for writing compilers and operating systems it has been used equally well to write major programs in many different domains many of the important ideas of c stem from the language bcpl developed by martin richards the influence of bcpl on the c proceeded indirectly through the language b which was written by ken thompson in 1970 for the first unix system on the deck pdp7 deck pdp7 was a mini computer produced by digital equipment corporation as part of the pdp series introduced in 1964 bcpl and b are typeless language by contrast c provides a variety of data types the fundamental data types are characters integers and floating point numbers of several sizes in addition there is a hierarchy of derived data types created with pointers arrays structures and unions c provides the fundamental control flow constructions required for well structured programs statement grouping decision making such as if else statements selecting one of the set of possible cases which are the switch case statements looping with the termination test at the top which are the while and the for loops or at the bottom which are the do statements and early loop exits like the break statements now let's move on to the advantages of c almost all popular languages are built on top of the c language like python java ruby javascript and c sharp all these languages are c level languages it means their languages their libraries are written in c code which then translates to higher level language which is then called javascript or java secondly it's the coding language of choice for kernel development a kernel is the central part of an operating system it manages the operations of the computer and the hardware most notably memory and the cpu time So if we need something that needs to be fast like operating system or something that needs to have very close access to hardware on your machine C is the first language that we choose for this purpose ultimately C is used most often in kernel development third advantage is C has been around for almost 30 years C is used in many embedded systems and many high level languages high level languages are built on top of c so there's always going to be some knowledge of c that you are going to need as a programmer fourth point is writing code in c tells you how a computer really works so you will understand about memory management and allocation last but not the least still there are high demands for jobs in c c programming is portable It's ideal for applications which requires high performance and low memory overhead because of its relatively small library. 
That's why there is a demand of jobs in C and it's going to exist in future. Now that you know about the history and how C works, let's move on to our main topics and know more about C programming in detail. So let's begin. In this video, before we get into our main course, I will show you a basic C program so that you will get an idea of how the C program is written. So let's begin. So this is the basic program that I have written for you guys so that you can understand before going into a main course that how C program works. Here, as you can see, I have written first line main and then empty parenthesis. So this main you are seeing here, this main is a special function which marks the beginning of the program, which tells the compiler that this is the start of the program. So now every program must have at least one main function in it. But note that if you use more than one main function inside your program, then compiler will get confused which one is the start of the program. So don't use more than one main function in your program. Now, after this, after the main function, you can see this, this empty parenthesis tells us that the main function doesn't have any arguments or any parameters in it. Now on the second line, as you can see, I have written this curly braces, this opening curly braces tells the compiler that this is the start of this main function. So this is the start of the main function and this is the closing curly braces that marks that this is the end of the function. But in this case, this curly braces marks the end of the program because we have not written anything after it. Now this opening and closing curly braces marks the function body. Now inside this curly braces, whatever we write becomes the function body. So this is the main function. This is a function main and this is the function body. And as you can see here that inside this function body, we have three statements written. So these statements are called the instructions of the function body, which are used to perform a certain given task. So on my first statement, as you can see, this is called the comment line. So as you can see, the comment line starts with the forward slash and star. So whatever you write inside the forward slash and star, and then ending with star and forward slash, whatever you write inside this will become a comment. So comment is a non executable statement. So whatever you write inside this will become a comment so that any other user or any other programmer, they will get to know what is the use of this particular function body? What is the use of this main function? These comments are non executable. Therefore, these lines are ignored by the compiler. Now let's move on to the printf function. So this printf function is a predefined standard function which is used for printing output. So this is our output. As you can see, hello world will be our output. Now predefined means this printf was written and compiled and is linked to our program at the time of linking. Now note that this printf function is ending with the semicolon. So this semicolon is very important. Whenever we end our statement in C, we write a semicolon at the end of it. This is also a comment and this is also a comment and this is our printf statement, which is the only executable statement in our program. So now when I run it, you can see hello world has been printed. This hello world. So this is all about the sample program that I wanted to tell you before getting into our course. Hey guys, we saw a basic C program so that you could understand the working of programs in C. Now here in this video, we will talk about a first topic, which is the basic structure of C program. So here it is on the left part of the screen, you can see this is the basic structure of C program and on the right hand side of the screen, this is the program that I have written to make you understand which part of this program comes in which section of this basic structure of C. So here comes the first section, which is the documentation section. In this documentation section, we write set of comments, which tells 
about the program basically documentation section is the description of the program so here this first line sample program created by coders arcade is the documentation section of this particular program now let's move on to the next section which is the link section the link section contains the links of the li system libraries which are used inside a program so we have written here hash include stdio.h and hash include conio.h these two stdio.h and conio.h are the system libraries of c which we are going to use inside our program so we need to include those libraries so we have written hash include stdio.h and hash include conio.h then comes the definition section so this definition section contains all the symbolic constants so this is our definition section here in this program so these symbolic constants refers to those constants whose values cannot be changed whose values are permanent and cannot be changed again in the program then comes the global declaration section this global declaration section contains the variables that we are going to use in different different part of the program we declare those variables once and then we can use them any number of times whenever we want in a particular function so as you can see here i have declared int a equals to 10 here a is the global variable which has the value 10 in it and we are using this particular a variable inside our main function and again we are using inside our void function so we are using this variable two times that is why we have declared it inside the global declaration section so this variable can be used any number of times inside a program we need to declare it just once here in the global declaration section then comes the main function section as i told you before in our video that we need to have at least one main function inside a program so this is the main function so this main function tells our compiler that this is the start of our main function now this main function consists of two parts which is the declaration part and the executable part so as you can see i have declared one b variable which has 20 value in it so this is the declaration part this is the local declaration part so why it is local because i have declared it inside the main function and now this variable can only be used by our main function only we cannot use this b inside our void fun function because it is not globally defined here if we need to use this b variable then we need to declare it inside the global declaration section just because we have declared it inside the main function now it is a local variable and which is local to only this function so this is the declaration part of this main function then comes the executable part of the main function so from this clear screen to this fun this is called the executable part whatever we write inside the executable part will be executed and then it will give us the output so this is the declaration part and this is the executable part of the main function now comes the sub program section which contains the n number of user defined functions so this as you can see void fun this comes under the sub program section here after main function after this main function we can define any number of functions which will come under the sub program section of the program so this is the sub program section where you can define any number of functions so this is all about the basic structure of c on the left hand side as you can see this is the basic structure of c so the documentation section which contains the comment the link section which contains all the libraries which we are going to use inside a program then comes the definition section this definition section contains the values which cannot be changed further in our program then comes the global declaration section where we declare those variable which will be used in different part of our program repeatedly and then we come into the main section function as i told you before we need at least one main function section so this is our main function section here and then comes the sub program section which can contains n number of user defined functions hey guys so in this video we will be talking about our next topic which is executing a program 
and I'll tell you step by step how the C program is executed. So, executing a program written in C involves a series of steps which includes creating the program, compiling the program, linking the program with the functions that are needed from the C library and then finally executing the program. So I'll illustrate the process of creating, compiling and executing a C program through a help of flowchart. So first our system gets ready and then I'll enter a program through my program which I have and then I'll check from my end if there is any error in the program. After that, I'll be compiling my program through the C compiler and then the compiler will check for any syntax error. If there are any syntax error, I'll be going back to my edit source program block where I'll be checking again if there, might, if there is any error inside my program or not. Then if there are no errors, then the compiler will link the system libraries to the program through the link section and then I will be executing my code. So while executing my code, my program will prompt me to input the data and then it will check for logical and data errors. If there is any logical error, I will be prompted to go back to my edit source program block and then again I will be checking if there is any errors or not. If there is no logical error but there is a data error then I will be prompted again to input the data and then check again if there is any logical or data errors or not. If there are no errors then the correct output will be printed and then the program will stop or terminate it. So this is how the program is executed in the C. Hey guys, so in this video we will be talking about our next topic which is constants. So constants in C refers to the fixed values that does not change during the execution of a program. C supports several types of constants such as numeric constants and character constants. Again numeric constant consists of two more constants which are integer constants and the real constants. In a similar way character constants also have two more constants which are single character constants and the string constants. So let us talk about a first constant which is the integer constant. So the integer constant refers to the sequence of digits. Now there are three types of integers namely decimal integer, octal integer and hexadecimal integer. So in the decimal integer consists of digits from 0 to 9 proceeding by the optional minus or plus sign. Let us see the examples for the decimal integer constants which are let's say 1, 2, 3, minus 3, 2, 1, 0, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 and plus 78. These are all the decimal integer constants example. Now if we talk about the octal integer constants then these constant consist of any combination of digits from 0 to 7 with the leading of 0. Example 0, 3, 7, 0, 0, 4, 3, 5, 0, 5, 5, 1. So from starting 0, we can write any number inside the limit 0 to 7. Similarly, a sequence of digits preceded by 0x or 0 capital X is considered as hexadecimal integer. There may also include alphabet A through F or small a through small f. The letter a through f represents the number 10 through 15. So following are the examples for the valid hex integers. So let's say 0x2, 0x9f, 0xbcd or 0x. So these are the hexadecimal integers. Now let's move on to the real constants which is the second variety of numerical constants. So integer numbers are adequated to represent quantities that vary continuously such as distance, height, temperature, price and so on. So these quantities are represented by the number containing fractional part like 17.548. Such numbers are called real or floating point constants. Let's see an example of those. So like 0.008 3 or minus 0 0.75 or 
फोर थ्री फाइव पॉइंट थ्री सिक्स और प्लस टू फोर सेवन डॉट जीरो सो दीज आर ऑल द रियल कॉन्स्टेंट्स नाउ लेट्स मूव ऑन टू द सिंगल कैरेक्टर कॉन्स्टेंट सो अ सिंगल कैरेक्टर कॉन्स्टेंट और सिंपली अ कैरेक्टर कॉन्स्टेंट कंटेन्स अ सिंगल कैरेक्टर क्लोज विद इन द पेयर ऑफ सिंगल कोट मार्क्स सो वेन यू राइट अ सिंगल कैरेक्टर और सिंगल इंटीजर इन साइड अ कोर्ट्स it will be recognized as a single character constant now let's move on to the string constant so a string constant is a sequence of characters includes in a double quotes so the characters may be letters numbers special characters and a blank space like in double quotes if we write hello or in double quotes if you give an integer value as well it will be recognized as a string constant inside the quotes so you can write under double quotes 1987 or you can write well done or you can give any symbol like question mark uh, full stop or an exclamation mark or you can give 5 plus 3 or anything you want also one more thing that i wanted to tell you are the backslash character constant that c supports so the c supports some back special backslash character constants that can be used in output functions so these are some of the backslash character constants as you can see here backslash a which means audible alert backslash b which means backspace backslash f which means form feed backslash n which means new line backslash r which means carriage return backslash t which means horizontal tab and then backslash v which means vertical tab and so on there are many more backslash character constants so this is all about the constants in c so our next topic is variables so a variable is a data name that may be used to store a data value unlike constant that remains unchanged during the execution of a program a variable may take different values at different times during execution so a variable name can be chosen by a programmer in a meaningful way so that it reflects the function or nature in the program some examples of such names are like average height total counter 1 class strength and as i mentioned earlier variable names may be consist of letters digits and the underscore characters subject to the following conditions first condition is they must begin with a letter some system permits underscore as the first characters but usually we should begin our variable name with a letter second point is ansi standard recognizes a length of 31 characters however length should not be normally more than 8 characters since only the first 8 characters are treated as significant by many compilers so usually in this case we should use only maximum of 8 characters while defining a variable third point is that c is a case sensitive language so so you need to take care about the upper case and the lower case letters so total is not the same as total or the full capital total then my fourth point is it should not be a keyword so keywords such as for if print f these kind of keyword should not be a variable because those are some reserved keywords in c then fifth white spaces are not allowed so you cannot define a variable which has a white white space in between so some examples of valid variable names are john delhi mark value x1 someone t rays ph value distance so you saw here that in uh, t rays i have given a underscore instead of white space if i had to give a white space in between then it would be a illegal variable so instead of white space i have used underscore so finally how to declare a variable so to declare a variable you need to write the variable name then to give this variable a value we write equals and then we write the data that needs to be transferred into it so if i write an integer a then i need to define the data type which is int for the integer value as it contains the integer value inside it so 
about this int it comes into a data type that i'll be discussing about in the next topic so this is how a variable is declared in c now our next topic is data types in c so data type specifies how we enter the data into a program and what type of data we enter c language has some predefined set of data types to handle various kinds of data that we can use in our program so these data types have different storage capacities basically c supports two types of data types which are the primary data types and the derived data types in the primary data types these are the fundamental data types namely integer floating point character and void and the derived data types in derived data types are just the primary data types but with a little twist or grouped together like arrays structures union and pointers so data type determines the type of data a variable will hold if a variable x is declared as int that means x can only hold the integer value every variable which is used in the program must be declared as what data type it is so let's look on the different types of data types so first one is the integer data types so basically integers are used to store whole numbers the next is the floating point floating point are the decimal point numbers and the character types are used to store the character values and void type void typically means no values so this is usually used to specify the type of function which returns nothing hey guys so in today's video we are going to talk about operators in c so what are operators i'm pretty sure that we all are using operators on a daily basis in our day to day lives let me give you an example suppose you are in a shop and you are buying some items now you are going to pay for those items to the shopkeeper now suppose the total is 475 bucks but you give the shopkeeper 500 bucks and now you start calculating in your mind that how much you will be getting back from the shopkeeper so while you are thinking you are doing some mathematical operations in your mind those operations are done by operators in this case operator is minus and the operation is subtraction so basically you are thinking here what amount you will be getting back similarly there are many operations in our day to day lives such as division multiplication addition and so on there are many many more operations that we use similarly in c programming c supports a rich set of built in operations so basically an operator is a symbol that tells the computer to perform certain mathematical or logical operations operators can be used in program to manipulate data and variables symbols like plus minus multiplication division all of these symbols are operators so now let's see how many types of operator we have in c so c operators can be classified into the following types here you can see the first one is the arithmetic operators then relational operators then logical operators then bitwise operators then assignment operators the conditional operators and the special operators so let us look all these operators one by one so first one is the arithmetic operators so what are arithmetic operators arithmetic operators are basic operators such as plus minus multiplication division and modulus so let us see what all these operators do so the plus sign here adds two operands so if we write like 1 plus 1 then 1 and 1 on both the side of this operator on this plus sign are the two operands and this plus sign is the operator so what this operator will do will add two operands similarly this minus sign this minus will subtract second operand from the first so suppose a minus b so b will be subtracted from a then similarly star in c star represents the multiplication so this is the star operator or the multiplication operator so this will multiply two operands 
now comes the forward slash or the division operator which is used in C to divide numerator by denominator. So in this case, this operator will divide numerator by denominator in simple fraction. Then comes the modulus operator. This modulus operator gives the remainder of the division. Now suppose this division operator divides the numerator by the denominator. But this modulus operator, what it will do is the remainder which is left by dividing numerator by denominator, that remainder will be fetched by this modulus operator. And this will give the remainder of that particular division. So these are all the arithmetic operators. Now let's go on to the second type, which is the relational operators. So these are all the relational operators. So let's check all of these one by one. So first one is double equals. So what this double equals does is it checks if two operands are equal. That means suppose here we write a double equals b. Then it will check if the b has the same value as a. Then comes the second operator, the second relational operator, which is exclamation equals. This means not equals. So what this operator will does is checks if two operands are not equal. Then comes greater than operators. So what it does is it will check if the operator on the left is greater than the operator on the right hand side. Similarly, with this smaller than operator. So this has the opposite of the greater than. So this will check if the operator on the left side is smaller than the operator on the right side. Then comes the second last relational operator which is greater than equal to. So this will check if the left operand is greater than or equals to the right operand. And similarly, smaller than equals. This will check if the operand on the left is smaller than or equals to the right operand. So these are all the relational operators in C. Let's move on to the other type which is logical operators. So C language supports following three logical operators. Now suppose value of A is 1 and value of B is 0. Then the first operator here is double ampersand or ampersand ampersand which means logical and here in this case let's see an example a ampersand ampersand b is false what this means is why is it false because value of a is 1 and the value of b is 0 logical and means both the value should be same otherwise it will give us false so since here value of a is 1 and value of b is 0. So that is why the value is false. Now suppose if the value of b becomes 1, then this value will be changed to true because now a is 1 and b is also 1. That is why th this will give us true. But in this case, since a is 1 and b is 0, both the operands doesn't have the same value. That is why it is giving us false. So in the case of logical and both the operators should be same then only it will give us true otherwise it will give us false. Then comes the next operator which is the OR operator. So OR operator is made by writing two pipe symbols. So this single line is called pipe symbol. So if you write double pipe then in C it will become logical OR operator. So what the logical OR operator does is it checks if any of the operand value is true then this will come true. So here in this case as you can see value of A is 1 and the value of B is 0. So in this case A or B is true. Why it is true? Because here the logic behind this is OR means any of the operand value should be true. In this case we have a is equals to 1 and b is equals to 0. It doesn't matter that a should be 1 or b should be 1. It can be 1 or 0. 
और ए कैन बी जीरो एन बी कैन बी वन और ए कैन बी जीरो एन बी आल्सो कैन बी जीरो इफ एनी ऑफ द वैल्यू इज वन देन इट विल गिव अस ट्रू सो दिस इज व्हाट और डज इज नाउ कम्स द थर्ड लॉजिकल ऑपरेटर व्हिच इज द एक्सक्लेमेशन मार्क और द लॉजिकल नॉट सो वॉट दिस लॉजिकल नॉट डज इज इट इल नेगेट द वैल्यू सो इन दिस केस सिंस ए इज वन नॉट ऑफ ए इज फॉल्स दैट मीन्स नॉट ऑफ ए मीन्स दिस वैल्यू इज नेगेटेड दैट मीन्स नाउ आफ्टर यूजिंग अ नॉट ऑपरेटर विद ए इट विल नेगेट द वैल्यू एंड इट विल चेंज द वैल्यू ऑफ ए फ्रॉम वन टू जीरो दैट इज वाई इट इज कमिंग फॉल्स If the value will be one, then it will give us true. But here, since the logical not is negating that value, it will give us false. So these are all the logical operators in C. Now let's move on to the other operator, which is the bitwise operator. So what this bitwise operator does is bitwise means bit by bit calculation. So bitwise operator performs manipulation of data at bit level. these operators also performs shifting of bits from left to right now note that bitwise operators are not applied on float or double so let us see these operators one by one so this is one single ampersand this single ampersand means bitwise and as in the logical operator we were using double ampersand that means logical and here in bitwise operators we use single ampersand to represent bitwise and similarly the bitwise or here in logical operator we were using double pipe sign that was representing logical or here in case of bitwise operator single pipe means bitwise or and then this cap symbol that you are seeing here means that is bitwise exclusive or operator here in this case basically it's the same as the not operator that we talked about earlier in the logical operator that is the logical not operator here in this case it is represented as cap and it is called bitwise exclusive or then comes the left shift operator and the right shift operator so the left shift operators is represented by this symbol which is smaller than smaller than and the right shift operator is represented by greater than greater than symbol so these two left shift and right shift operators will be talking about these two operators in our future videos in our advanced topic so stay tuned to our channel coders arcade and like share and subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon as well so that you will get notified when i post the video about left shift and the right shift operators so now let's understand all these bitwise operators with the help of truth table so this is the truth table for bitwise and bitwise or and the bitwise exclusive or so here this is the values of a and this is the values of b and here we are performing operations such as a ampersand b which is the a bitwise and b and a bitwise or b and a bitwise exclusive or b so let's first see about bitwise and operator so here if the value of a is 0 and the value of b is 0 then if we do bitwise and then it will give us 0 if the value of a is 0 and the value of b is 1 then it will give us 0 if the value of a is 1 and the value of b is 0 then again it will give us 0 and if the value of a is 1 and the value of b is 1 again it will give us 1 so while performing a bitwise and b 0 0 means 0 0 1 means 0 1 0 means 0 and 1 1 means 1 so this is the a bitwise and b now if we talk about a bitwise or b here in this case if the value of a is 0 and the value of b is 0 as well then we'll get 0 if the value of a is 0 and the value of b is 1 then we'll get 1 if now if the value of a is 1 and the value of b is 0 then we'll be getting 
if the value of a is 1 and the value of b is 1 again, it will give us 1. So basically, while we do a bitwise or b, then 0, 0 means 0, 0, 1 means 1, 1, 0 means 1, and 1, 1 means 1. Now let's see a bitwise exclusive or b. In this case, if the value of a is 0 and the value of b is 0, it will give us 0. If the value of a is 0 and if the value of b is 1, then it will give us 1. Again, if the value of a is 1 and the value of b is 0, then it will give us 1. And if the value of a is 1 and the value of b is 1, it will give us 0. So in this case, a bitwise exclusive or b means 0, 0 will give us 0, 0, 1 will give us 1, and 1, 0 will give us 1, and 1 and 1 will give us 0. So this is the truth table for all the bitwise operator. For the left shift and the right shift, as I told you before, we'll be covering those two bitwise operators in our future videos. So stay tuned for that. Now let's move on to the next operator, which is conditional operator. So here conditional means if else statement that we generally use in our programs. But here with the help of conditional operator, you can eliminate the whole if else statement and instead of writing if else statement, we can write the whole if else statement in one single line. So this is the syntax for the conditional operator. So syntax is question mark and colon. So just before question mark, we write our first expression here. After the question mark, we write second expression here. And after the colon, we write the third expression here. So as you can see on the left hand side, I have written a small program and then by the help of conditional operator, this conditional operator, I have written on the right hand side, I have written another program, which is the same program as the left hand side program. So I have written here int marks. So I, here I have declared marks as int. So this marks variable will only be able to carry integer numbers into it. So int marks, then I have used the conditional statement if else. So I have written if marks is greater than 33, then it will print pass. Otherwise it will print fail. So we can eliminate this whole if else statement with the help of conditional operators. As you can see here, I have written care result. So I have declared a variable result, which is the data type care, which means characters. So now result will be able to hold only character type, which is pass or fail. Then I have taken another variable called marks, which is int so that it can house this value 33 into it. So I have written here instead of using if else statement, I have written a result, this result equals marks greater than 33. This is our first expression here before question mark. This is our first expression. So this tells us that this is the first condition. So if marks is greater than 33, then after the question mark, it will print pass. Otherwise it will print fail. So this colon here represents the else block. And this question mark represents the if block and this expression one here represents our condition. So this means that if marks is greater than 33, then it will print pass same as here. Otherwise, else it will print fail, else it will print fail. So this is how you can use conditional operator. So now let's move on to our other operator, which is the assignment operator. C supports following types of assignment operators. So our first assignment operator is equals operator. So what it does is it assigns values from right side operand to left side operand. That means if I write a equals B, now suppose B has a value 20 and A is empty. A doesn't have anything inside it. So if I write A equals B, that means if B is 20, then this value 
this 20 value will be carried to A. So now the value of A is also 20. So if I write A equals B and the value of B is 20, then A will also become 20. Then our next operator is the plus equal sign. So what this does is it adds a right operand to the left operand and assign the result to the left. That means if I write A plus equals B, it is same as writing A equals A plus B. So instead of writing A equals A plus B, you can use this operator which is plus equals and write A plus equals B. So this will improve the efficiency of our program and reduce the repetition of our code. Again similarly, minus equals. Now this again means subtract right operand from the left operand and assign the result to left operand. That means a minus equals b is the same as writing a equals a minus b. Similarly, multiply equals or star equals. So what it does is it multiplies left operand with the right operand and assigns the result to the left operand. So again we can write instead of a equals a into b, we can just write a star equals b. So it is same as writing a equals a into b. Then our next operator is forward slash equals that means divide equals. So what it does is it divides left operand with the right operand and assigns the result to left operand which means a divide equals b is same as writing a equals a divided by b. So instead of writing a equals to a divided by b we can just simply write a divide equals b. Then comes our next operator which is modulus equals. So what this modulus equals does is it calculates modulus using two operands and assign the result to left operand. So again this means a modulus equals b is same as writing a equals a modulus b. So instead of writing a equals a modulus b we can just write a modulus equals b. So with the help of these operators we can reduce the re repetition of our code and increase our efficiency of our program. So this is all about assignment operators. So let's move on to our next last operators which are the special operators. So now C supports three special operators. The first special operator is size of. So what it does is it returns the size of an variable. That is this is the syntax of size of. So we write size of let's say our variable is x. So we write size of then in parenthesis we write x. So what it does is this will return the size of the variable x. Now next ampersand sign. Now this ampersand sign in special operators what it does is it will return the address of an variable. So this is the syntax of writing this special operator which is ampersand x. So what it does is it will return address of that particular variable which is x. So for example x has a value 5. Now where this x equals to 5 is saved on our computer it will give us the address of that particular memory location in our computer. Next star operator. So in special operator star means pointer to a variable. That means if we write star of x then it will give us the pointer to a variable which is x here. So this pointer here is a very advanced topic that we will be covering in our future videos. So stay tuned for that. So now you just need to know about this star special operator. So what it does is it will give us the pointer to a variable. So this is all about the operators in C language. So in this video we covered about arithmetic operators, relational operators, logical operators, bitwise operators, assignment operators, conditional operators and special operators. Hello everyone, welcome to our channel Codus Arcade. We will be talking about managing input and output operations in C. Before starting our video, I would like to request you to please 
like our videos and subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you receive a notification of our latest videos. So let's start. So reading, processing and writing of data are the three essential functions of a computer program. So most programs take some data as input and display the processed data often known as information or results on a suitable medium. In our earlier videos, we have discussed two methods of providing data to the program variables. One method is to assign values to variables through the assignment statements such as x equal to 5, a equal to 0 and so on. We have another method which is to use the input function scanf which can read data from a keyboard. We have used both these methods in our earlier videos and for getting the results as outputs we have used extensively the function printf which sends results out to a terminal. Unlike other high level languages C does not have any built in input output statements as part of its syntax. All input output operations are carried out through function calls such as printf and scanf. There exist several functions that have more or less become standard for input and output operations in C. These functions are collectively known as the standard input output library. So here we will be discussing more about some common input output functions that can be used in our C programs. There are many examples like mat.h, ctype.h, etc. So these have to be included in our header files so that we can use the libraries inside them or use the features inside them. So as I told you about the standard input output header file which is stdio.h. I will tell you more about this thing now. The file name stdio.h is an abbreviation for standard input output header file. The instruction hash include stdio.h tells the compiler to search for a file named stdio.h and place its contents at this point in the program. The contents of the header file become part of the source code when it is compiled. So as we learned, we can use the scanf function to take an input from the user and we can output the results into a terminal with the help of the printf function. We have some other functions with the help of which we can also do this. So let us see how to read a character with the help of the function which is called getCar. So the syntax for the getCar function is variable name is equal to getCar. So whenever this getCar function is encountered, the computer waits until a key is pressed and then assigns this character as a value to the getCar function. Since the getCar is used on the right hand side of an assignment statement, the character value of getCar is in turn assigned to the variable name on the left. For example, care name and then name equal to getCar. It means that getCar takes the character from the keyboard and then it assigns this character to the name variable, which here you can see it has been set to the character data type. The name variable is of the character data type. So getCare reads a character from the keyboard and then it assigns that character to the name variable. So this is the use of the getCare function. Now let me show you an example or a sample program where you will see the use of getCare function in an interactive environment. Here, this is my editor screen and I have already written down a program for you. You can see that I have included the header file which is include standard input output library. So to write that hash include stdioh is used. Then this is my main function and here you can see this is a variable which is of the character data type. The variable name is answer and it is of the character data type. Then I am using the printf function and I am asking the user, do you want to know my name? And this slash and characters are the escape characters which will take the control to the next line. I have used 
two slashes so it means it will take the control to the two lines after this line then i have used the printf statement again and here you can see i have written enter y for yes or n for no then you can see the use of the get care function here what it does is i have done answer equal to get care so this get care will wait for the input of a character from the keyboard and it will then assign that character to the answer variable which is of the character data type then finally i am using the if else statement so i am trying to check if the character input by the user is capital y and here you can see i have used the pipe symbol which is also the or and then what will happen is i am trying for capital y or small y so in both the cases i will be getting the same result because the user may provide a capital y or else a small y so i don't want to get confused so what i have done is i am taking capital y and small y with the help of this or operator then if the character input is capital y or small y i am printing my name is mr bean or else if it is no or if the input from the user is n or any other character then it will be printing this statement which is you are good for nothing this is a basic example i will show you by running it the output so that you can analyze what is actually happening with the program so for that let me run it so this is the command prompt for you here it's asking me i will just zoom it for you okay now you can see it's asking me do you want to know my name it says enter y for yes or n for no i will show you both the outputs first i will give y and then i will press enter you can see my name is mr bean so in case capital y or small y it is giving me the proper answer which is my name is mr bean then i will press enter again i will run it for you and this case i will again zoom it for you and here i will give capital y now and press enter you can again see the answer is the same my name is mr bean then i will press enter again and i will run it once again for you this time i will show you the opposite or the else block print statement here i will press n and press enter now you can see the output says you are good for nothing so this is how it works what happens is i will press the enter key and you can see as soon as it encounters this answer equal to get character it will read a character from the keyboard which will be provided by the user i will run it again you can see after these two print statements i will zoom it again you can see after these two print statements are executed then it's waiting for the character to be provided by the user so this is the use of the get character now if i provide any keyboard character say zero also and press enter then it will say you are good for nothing because it goes into the else block i'll press enter and you can see it says you are good for nothing so this is how the get character works i'll press enter so this is a basic example where you can read a character from the user with the help of the keyboard now let me show you one more program where you will learn how to read a character from the user and at the same time how to check whether the character provided by us is a digit or an alphabet so in this case we will be using the built in keywords is alpha is digit so that we can check whether a character provided by us is an alphabet or a digit so i have the program for you i will just show it to you so as you can see here is the program to check whether a character is an alphabet or a number or a digit so here you can see the change this is alpha is digit are the keywords that i have used here you can see is alpha is digit have been used so to use this 
what you have to do is you have to use another library or you have to use another library where you will be getting all this is digit is alpha features so this is the library which i have used here hash include c type dot h if you use this library you will be getting all these features is alpha is digit and so on there are many more but i am only using these two features or methods now you can see the whole program i will explain it line by line here you can see i have used the character variable which is the character data type then i am printing press any key and followed by i am using character equal to get cat then here it will wait for the input from the user and finally here you can see it will check if is alpha character greater than 0 what this greater than 0 means that if this character that is passed by us is an alphabet then this greater than 0 means that it will be true so this will be a character which is an alphabet so this greater than 0 means it is true otherwise by default it will be set to false and it will go into the else statement so here if we provide an alphabet then it will print character is a letter otherwise it will go into the else block and you can see i have used again an if and else statement inside this else which is called the nested conditional statement I, we will be talking about this more in the future videos for the time being just try to understand the logic behind the program and as i said if this condition is not true then it will go into the else block and here it will be checking is does it and then here again the same thing occurs if it is greater than zero means it's true so that the character entered by the user is a digit then it will print character is a digit or else it will print character is not alphanumeric it means that the character is neither an alphabet nor a digit so this is the basic program and i will run it for you so that you can understand what is actually happening let me run it You can see it it is prompting me by telling press any key i will just zoom it for you and now i will provide a key say seven and then i will press enter you can see it says character is a digit so i'll press enter and i will show you the other part of the output i will run it again and let me zoom it for you here if i press a and press enter you can see it says character is a letter and let me show you the third part of the output which is if we enter any character which is neither an alphabet or a digit then it will say the character is not alphanumeric let me do it for you i'll press enter then i will run it again the shortcut for this is f9 and then i will just zoom it then here I will just give any character, say start and press enter. Now you can see it says character is not alphanumeric. I'll press enter. So this is a basic C program where you can use the get care method and also this is digit and is alpha methods with the help of which you can take an input character from the user and check whether it is an alphabet or a digit or not so now let us move on to the next topic which is writing a character so like get care there is an analogous function put care for writing characters one at a time to the terminal it takes the form as shown below put care then in brackets variable name where variable name is a type character variable containing a character. This statement displays the character contained in the variable name at the terminal. For example, the statement answer equal to y in quotes, then put char answer will display the character y on the screen. 
and the statement put care and in brackets slash n would cause the cursor on the screen to move to the beginning of the next line. So this is the use of the put care function with the help of which we can write a character. So now I will show you an example of using the put care function. So this program will read a character from the keyboard and then print it in reverse case. Suppose if the input is in upper case, it will give the output in the lower case. And if it is in lower case, it will be giving the output in lower case. What it will do is if the input is upper case, the output will be lower case. And if the input is lower case, the output will be upper case. So let's check the program. Here you can see this is the program. Here also you can see just because we are using this is lower, two upper and these two lower functions, we have to use this c type dot h header file. So let me explain you the logic behind this program. Here we have this variable alphabet which is of the character data type. Then I am using the printf function to print enter an alphabet. Then what I am doing is I am using the put care function which is actually for writing a character. In this case what it will do is it is taking the slash in inside the quotes. So this thing will give the control to the next line. You can see here I have written the comment move to the next line. So as soon as this put care function is utilized, it will give the control to the next line. Then what I am doing is I am using the get care function and taking a input from the user with the help of the keyboard and this input will be assigned to the alphabet variable. And then I am checking with the if else statement. If is lower alphabet, this is lower is a built in method. It will check if the character in the alphabet is lower, then it will provide the upper case with the help of this statement. You can see put care to upper alphabet. So it will convert the lower case to upper case. And if it is lower case, then it will go on to the else statement. And if it is not lower case and it is upper case, then it will go on to the else statement and it will convert it to lower case with the help of this put care function where I have used two lower than in brackets alphabet. You have to follow the syntax of writing all this. We will be discussing more and more about all these programs in our future videos. So this is how we can read a character and we can convert it from uppercase to lowercase and vice versa. So let me run it for you so that you can understand. I will run it. And here you can see, I will just zoom it for you. It's asking me enter an alphabet. So here I will give a small a and press enter. And you can see it's converting it to capital A. So this is small a. So here this is lower thing is true and it is converting it to a uppercase. That is capital A. Now I will show you the other way around. I will run it again. And let me zoom it. And here I will give capital A and press enter. And you can see it converts it to lowercase that is small a. So this is about this code. So this is about this code where you can read a character from the user and convert it to a uppercase or lowercase depending on the type of input given by the user. With with the help of using this put care function followed by this two upper or two lower and you have to check it using the is lower method. Hello everyone, we will be discussing the next topic which is decision making and branching in C language. So before starting the video, I would like to request you people to please like our videos, share it with your friends and family and press the bell icon so that you receive a notification of our latest updates. Thank you. So let's start with today's topic. So what is decision making and branching? 
Decision making is about deciding the order of execution of statements based on certain conditions or repeat a group of statements until certain specified conditions are met. C language handles decision making by supporting the following statements which are the if statement, the switch statement, the conditional operator, the go to operator. So these are the four types of decision making statements used in C as I told you. As you can see here these are the if statement, the switch statement, the conditional operator statement and the go to statement. These statements are popularly known as decision making statements. Since these statements control the flow of execution, they are also known as control statements. We have already used some of these statements in the earlier examples. Here we shall discuss their features, capabilities and applications in more detail. So let us start with the first one which is the if statement. So the if statement is a powerful decision making statement and is used to control the flow of execution of statements. It is basically a two way decision statement and is used in conjunction with an expression. It takes the following form or syntax as you can see here. If test expression. It allows the computer to evaluate the expression first and then depending on whether the value of the expression, relation or condition is true or false, it transfers the control to a particular statement. This point of program has two paths to follow, one for the true condition and the other for the false condition as shown in the figure. As you can see here, there is an entry and then you have the test expression. If the expression is false, then it follows the false path. If it is true, it follows the true path. This is called the two way branching. Some examples of decision making using if statements are as follows. If bank balance is zero, borrow money. Then if room is dark, put on lights. If code is one, person is male or else if age is more than 55, you can take any other number, age is more than 60, person is retired. So the if statement may be implemented in different forms depending on the complexity of conditions to be tested. The different forms of the if statement are the simple if statement, the if else statement, the nested if else statement and the if else ladder. We shall discuss each one of them in the next few minutes. So let's start with the simple if statement. The general form of a simple if statement is if test expression then the statement blocks then after that statement x. The statement block may be a single statement or a group of statements. If the test expression is true the statement block will be executed. Otherwise, the statement block will be skipped and the execution will jump to the statement X. Remember, when the condition is true, both the statement block and the statement X are executed in sequence. This is illustrated by this flowchart. So you can see here, we have the entry, then the test expression and it follows two paths, true and false. If it is true, it will execute the statement block, then it will go to the statement X. If it is false, it will directly go to the statement X. Then it will go on to the next statement. So let us look at an example where we will be knowing about the if statement more. I will go to my editor now. So here you can see in my editor, I have already written a program for you. And I have included the standard input output library by writing this hash include stdio.h. Then this is my main function. And here I have declared four variables which are integer data type. And I have taken another variable ratio which is of the floating data type. Then I am asking the user to input this four integer values. And then I am taking the user input by using the scanf function. 
then what I am trying to do is I am trying to calculate the ratio. When I am calculating the ratio, I am doing it when the value of C minus D is not equal to 0 because if C minus D is 0, then you cannot divide any number with 0. So I am giving this if block and here I am taking the condition C minus D not equal to 0. Then if it is true, then it will calculate the ratio like this. It will calculate A plus B and then it will calculate C minus D and then it will divide A plus B by C minus D and finally it will print the ratio. If C minus D is not equal to 0 or the statement is false, then it will do nothing. It will just go out of the program execution. So I will run it for you and show it to you. The shortcut is F9. I am pressing it. So I will just zoom it for you so that you can see it better. Now it's visible. I will give four numbers. You can see I'm giving one, then two, then three, and then four. So if I press enter now, the ratio will be calculated because you can see three minus four will be minus one. So it is not zero. It will calculate the result. I'm pressing enter. And here you can see the ratio comes in minus because three minus four is minus one. And we are getting the answer as minus 3.0 because this is float. So the program is working correctly and I will press enter once again. I will show you the alternative part where this thing will not work. So I am pressing F9 once again to run it. And here you can see I will zoom it once again. Now I will provide the values again say 1, 2 and 3. This is C and for D again I will give 3. So 3 minus 3 will be 0. And now you can see it will not print the ratio. I will press enter. And now you can see it finished the process but it did not give any output. So this is a simple example of the if statement. I will press enter. So here you can see only when this condition is true then it is executing this part of the code. Otherwise it is simply going out of the execution statement and it is ending the program. So now I will show you another example of the if statement where we will be using a compound operator. So here you can see this is another program where I am using the if statement but with the compound operator. What I am doing is I am trying to calculate the number of boys who have their weight less than 50 and who have their height greater than 170. So to combine them I am using this line of code and here you can see this AND AND. This is the AND operator. So what it will do is if both these conditions are true only then it will increment this count by count equal to count plus 1. So I will explain the whole program line by line. Here we can see this is the count variable and the i variable which are integer and I have the weight and the height. Then I am initializing the count to 0 and I am taking this print statement where I am telling the user to enter the weight and height for 10 boys and here you can see I am using a for loop and then I am asking the user to input the weight and height and after a single value is provided, I am incrementing the count to count plus 1. So as soon as we will be getting any one boy weight less than 50 and height greater than 170, this count equal to count plus 1 will be executed and this count equal to 0 value will be incremented. So like this we will be getting the number of boys who have weight less than 50 and also height greater than 170. So this 50 is in kg and this height is in 170 centimeters. So after that I am trying to print the number of boys with weight less than 50 and height greater than 170 and with the help of this count. So this count will be incremented and we will be getting the result. So now let me show how it works. I will run it for you. I am pressing F9 and you can see let me zoom it for you. It says enter weight and height for 10 boys. 
so i will give say 45 and space 172 enter i will give many other values 36 150 and i will keep on giving it 170 so now you can see i have given 10 weight and height values for boys for 10 boys and you can see all these values here so my condition was less than 50 kg and greater than 170 so this one satisfies it and again i will show you which one satisfies it and i guess i gave only one value which satisfies this condition so now if i press enter you will be finding the number of boys who have their weight less than 50 and height greater than 170 i am pressing enter and you can see number of boys with weight less than 50 and height greater than 170 is 2 so let us check in our data here you can see i missed it out you can see the first one is 45 and 172 this satisfies and this is 39 and 182 this as well satisfies so we are getting this count equal to 2 so this is how this program is working i am pressing enter and this was an example of an if statement where you can use the compound and operator and then you can put an expression in the if block and you can execute it so now let us move on to the next one which is the if else statement so the if else statement is an extension of the simple if statement the general form is as you can see in the diagram if test expression true block statements else false block statements then finally the statement x so here if the test expression is true then the true block statements immediately following the if statements are executed otherwise the false block statements are executed in either case either true block or false block will be executed not both so whichever is true will be executed this thing is illustrated with the following flow chart in both the cases the control is transferred subsequently to the statement x as you can see in the flow chart here so here you can see for the test expression to be true it goes to the true block statement and then to the statement x if it is false it goes to the false block statement and then to the statement x let us take a small example so that we can understand more about this if else statement i will go to my editor now so here you can see i have already written a program for you this program actually checks whether a number is even or odd so here you can see i have taken an integer data type variable which is number then what i am doing is i am using the print statement to print this in the console or the terminal and then i am taking the user input which is the number then i am checking with the help of two so definition according to the definition of even numbers if it is divisible by two then it is a even number or else it is an odd number so here if the number is divisible by 2 you can see i am using this mode operator so this will give the remainder so that means if number is divided by 2 and the remainder is 0 then it is an even number or else it is an odd number so here after this statement is checked if it is true then it will print it is an even number or else it will print it is an odd number so let me run it so that you can understand i am pressing f9 and let me zoom it for you so that you can check i am putting the number 9 so this is an odd number right if i press enter you can see it displays the number is odd so the program is working perfectly i will try to show you the even one also let me press enter and i will run it again and let me zoom it for you say i press 4 and press enter so you can see the number is even so i showed you how to use the if else statement here and in this case i am checking 
whether a number is even or odd by using this program. So you can do many more things with the help of this if, if and else statement. So now let us move on to the next topic which is nesting of if else statements. So when a series of decisions are involved, we may have to use more than one if else statement in nested form as shown in the diagram here. So you can see in this diagram, if the condition 1 is false, the statement 3 will be executed, otherwise it continues to perform the second test. If the condition 2 is true, statement 1 will be evaluated, otherwise the statement 2 will be evaluated and then the control is transferred to the statement x. So let us check a flow chart so that we can understand more about this nested if else statement. So here you can see when the test condition 1 is true then it goes to the test condition 2 and again it will check the test condition 2. If it is true it will go to statement 1, if it is false it will go to statement 2. Then finally, it will go to statement x and then to the new statement. But initially, if the test condition 1 is false, it will directly go to statement 3 and then it will go to statement x and then to the next statement. So this is how it becomes very easy to understand the flow of the nested if a statement. So let us take an example so that we can know and understand the nesting of if else statements in a very good way. I will go to my editor now. So here you can see I have already written out a program using the nested if else statement. Here what I am trying to do is I am taking an user input of three numbers and then trying to print the largest of the three numbers. So let me show you what I have done here. You can see I have taken three variables a, b and c which belong to the floating data type. Now I am taking the input from the user and then I am printing the largest number is then here you can see this is the entire condition. Here I have used the nested if else statement. You can see if a is greater than b then it will go into this block. You can see here. After a is greater than b, if it is true, then it will check if a is greater than c, then finally we will be ending up with the conclusion that a is greater than both b and c, therefore it will print a as the greatest number, else it will print c as the greatest number. Or else if this condition is initially false, then we can assume that b is greater than a, then we will check b with c. So if b is greater than c then it will print b or else it will print c. So this is a simple logic behind the program here so that we can get the largest of three numbers. I will just run it and show it to you how to use it. I am pressing F9 and let me zoom it for you. So here I will give three numbers say 5 then 6 and then 4. You can see I got the output, the largest number is 6. It is coming in 6 point this decimal digits because I took it as a floating point value. So the program is working correctly and out of 5, 6 and 4, 6 is the largest. So I am getting the answer correctly. I press enter and let me check it with any other values. I will run it again and let me zoom it for you. I will take 12 press enter, 13, press enter, then I will take 0, 2, press enter. Then you can see out of these three numbers, 13 is the greatest. So it's printing this, the largest number is 13. And this decimal points is because I have taken the floating point data type. So this program is working perfectly. I press enter. And here you got to see how to find the largest of three numbers using the nested if else statement. So here you need to be very careful regarding the indentation because otherwise you will get confused. If I had written all this if else statements in the same line, you would have got confused. That's why to properly 
demonstrate the use of the nested if else statement i have used this indentation you can see there is a space between this so in order to make your program look good and to make people understand how you were utilizing your source code it's better to provide indentation you can do it without using indentation also but i suggest you use indentation so that your code looks better and it is very easy to understand so now let us move on to the next topic which is the else if ladder here what happens is if you have more than one condition or i can or to be precise i can say if you have more than two conditions and it may go on to say maybe five six seven conditions in that case we will be using the else if ladder it becomes very easy to execute the flow of the conditions with the help of this else if ladder you can see the general syntax of this else if ladder here so here you can see the if statement has the condition 1 and the statement 1 then the else if has the condition 2 statement 2 and similarly it will go on and finally the final else statement will have the default statement and then after all it will give the control to the statement x this construction is known as the else if ladder the conditions are evaluated from the top of the ladder downwards as soon as the true condition is found the statement associated with it is is executed and the control is transferred to the statement x and it will automatically skip the rest of the ladder but when all the end conditions become false then the final else condition which contains the default statement will be executed so let us check a flow chart where you will understand better about it so here in this flow chart you can see it will initially check all the conditions condition 1 condition 2 condition 3 condition n and whenever it finds the true condition it will give the control to the statement x and in other case whenever all the n conditions are not true it will execute the default statement and then it will give the condition to statement x and finally it will go to the next statement so this is a beautiful way to understand about the else if ladder and let us take an example in our editor so that we will understand more about this else if ladder so here you can see this is the use of the else if ladder here we have taken many conditions you can see what i have done actually in this program is i have initialized a variable i which is of the integer data type and taken the value to be 50 here and then i am using the else if ladder first i am checking if the value of i is 50 then it will be printing i is 50 otherwise it will go to the next condition it will check if i is 55 it will print i is 55 or else it will go to this line where it will check i is 60 it will print i is 60 and finally if all this three statements are false then it will continue to the else statement where it will print the default print if statement which is i is not present so as i told you in the flow chart it checks all the conditions and finds the true condition and then it goes to this end of the program here in this case it will try to execute all the statements if none of them are true then it will print the default statement but in my case i have taken i equal to 50 and this first if statement is actually true so let me run it so that you can get an idea i am pressing f9 and here you can see i am getting i is 50 because you can see the i value is 50 so let change it i will change it to 20 and then i will run it again i will press f9 here you can see as soon as i change the value of i to 20 it says i will zoom it let me zoom it for you i is not present
So this is a basic example of the LC flutter. You can do many more operations with the help of this LC flutter. So as I told you, if you have more than two conditions, you can use this method and you will be able to sort out the flow of your output. So let us move on to the next topic, which is the switch statement. So we have seen that when one of the many alternatives is to be selected, we can use an if statement to control the selection. However, the complexity of such a program increases dramatically when the number of alternatives increases. The program becomes difficult to read and follow. At times, it may confuse even the person who designed it. Fortunately for us, C has a built-in multi-way decision statement known as a switch. The switch statement tests the value of a given variable or expression against a list of case values. And when a match is found, a block of statements associated with that case is executed. The general form of the switch statement is as shown here. So as you can see in this general form diagram, the expression is an integer expression or characters. Value 1, value 2 are constants of constant expressions and are known as case levels. Each of these values should be unique within a switch statement. Block 1, block 2, etc. are statement lists and may contain zero or more statements. There is no need to put braces around these blocks. Note that case levels end with a colon as you can see here. When the switch is executed, the value of the expression is successfully compared against the values value 1, value 2, etc. If a case is found whose value matches with the value of the expression, then the block of statements that follows the case are executed. The break statement at the end of each block signals the end of a particular case and causes an exit from the switch statement, transferring the control to the statement X following the switch. And finally, the default here is an optional case. When present, it will be executed if the value of the expression does not match with any of the case values. If not present, no action takes place if all matches fail and the control goes to the statement X. In C, we can use as many as 257 case levels. So let us check a flowchart of the switch statement as well. Here you can see we have the entry, then the switch expression, then we have this cases or the expressions which have the value 1, value 2 and finally the default and then whichever is true that case will be executed and if no case is true then the default case will be executed and then it will give the control to the statement x. So this is a flowchart defining the selection process of the switch statement. So let us check an example of the switch statement in our editor so that we can understand about the switch statement better. So here you can see I have written a program for a simple calculator using the switch statement. What I am doing is here you can see I have taken a variable operator which is of the character data type. With the help of this, I will take an input from the user about the type of operation he or she wants to do. It may be addition, subtraction, multiplication or division. Then I have taken two variables n1 and n2. This will be the operands and then they are of the floating point data type. Then here you can see this statement will tell the user which type of operation he wants to do. Then here you can see I am taking the type of operator input from the user and then I am taking this print statement which will tell the user to input the two operands. And then this is the use of the switch. And in the switch you can see this is the operator. The operator will be out of this four plus minus multiplication and division. And then you can see this is the syntax of writing it. These are the cases. So this will be the four cases. So if it is plus, then it will calculate the addition of n1 and n2, the two numbers. 
and then it will break. In this case, it will be n1 minus n2 for this negative symbol, which is subtraction. In this case, it will be multiplication and it will calculate the product and then it will break or else in this case, it will be division and it will calculate n1 divided by n2 and then it will break. Or suppose if all these four cases are not true and the user provides any other character, then it will print the default statement, which is error operator is not correct. So let us run this program so that we can check whether it is working properly or not. I'm pressing F9 and I'm running it. You can see, let the operator be divide and press enter. It is asking me for the two operands now. Say, let me give 20 and then I will give five and press enter. You can see it is dividing 20 by five here and it is printing the result, which is four. So five fours are 20, the answer is correct. So it is working right. Let me check it for other values as well. I will again run it. Let me zoom it for you. And if I put plus as the operator and press enter, it is asking me for the two operands. I will give one and then I will give two. So one plus two should be three. I'm pressing enter. You can see the answer is three here. And let me check when I give a character which is not present in these four values, which are this plus minus multiplication and divide. Let me give any other value. So I will press enter and then I will run it again. And here, let me give the character to be say a dot. You can see I've given a dot here and let me press enter. It's asking me for the operands. Let it be 12 and 13 say and press enter. You can see it says error operator is not correct. So this is how the switch case is working. Now let me press enter. You can see whenever this four cases are true, then any one of this case will be executed. Otherwise, if I provide an operator which is not present in this four operators, then it will be printing the default statement, which is error operator is not correct. So this is how the switch statement is used in C. So let us move on to the next topic, which is the conditional operator. So what is the conditional operator? The C language has an unusual operator useful for making two way decisions. This operator is a combination of question mark and colon and takes three operands. This operator is popularly known as the conditional operator or the ternary operator. The general form of use of the conditional operator is as follows. Conditional expression, comma, question mark, expression one, colon, expression two. The conditional expression is evaluated first. If the result is non-zero or true, expression one is evaluated and is returned as the value of the conditional expression. Otherwise, expression two is evaluated and its value is returned. For example, let us go on to the editor so that we can check an example and know the proper use of the conditional operator. So here you can see I am using this syntax of the conditional operator here in this program code. What I'm trying to do is I am taking a user input of the age of the user. So if the age of the user is less than 18, he or she is not eligible to vote. If it is more than 18, he or she is eligible to vote. That's what I'm trying to print in this program. So I'm taking the variable age, which is integer, then I'm telling the user to print his or her age. Then I'm using the conditional operator here. And you can see this is the condition age greater than equal to 18. If this is true, then it will print eligible for voting. If this statement is not true, it will print not eligible for voting. 
So let me run it so that you can understand and have a better idea. I'll press F9 and let me just zoom it for you. Enter your age, it says I will give 5 and press enter. Now you can see it says not eligible for voting. So I'll press enter again and let me run it and show you the other way around. So here again let me zoom it for you and let me show you by writing say 19 and press enter. Now you can see it says the other way around. It says eligible for voting because this is equal to or more than 18. So this program is working perfectly. So this is a way of the a way of using the conditional operator in C language. So now let us go on to the next topic which is the go to statement. So far we have discussed ways of controlling the flow of execution based on certain specific conditions. Like many other languages, C supports the go to statement to branch unconditionally from one point to another in the program. Although it may not be essential to use the go to statement in a highly structured language like C, there may be occasions when the use of go to might be desirable. The go to requires a label in order to identify the place where the branch is to be made. A label is any valid variable name and must be followed by a colon. This is very important. We have to follow a label by a colon. The label is placed immediately before the statement where the control is to be transferred. The general form of go to and label statements are shown here. You can see there are two forms which are the forward jump and the backward jump. Here the label can be anywhere in the program either before or after the go to label. Note that a go to breaks the normal sequential ex execution of the program. So in normal sequential execution it will be executed step by step but when you use the go to statement it breaks the normal sequence. If the label is before the statement go to label a loop will be formed and some statements will be executed repeatedly. Such a jump is known as the backward jump as you can see in the picture. On the other hand if the label is placed after the go to label some statements will be skipped and the jump is known as a forward jump. A go to is often used at the end of a program to direct the control to the to go to the input statement to read further data. So let us take an example where you will be understanding more about the go to statement. So here I am in my editor and you can see I have used the go to statement here and also here you can see. So what I am trying to do here is I have taken two variables x and y and I am trying to calculate the square root of this x variable and store it in this y variable. Therefore I have taken these two variables of the floating data type. Then this is the label read and then I am trying to take the user data for this x and then I am checking if the value of x is less than 0 then I am telling the control of the program to go to this read level again and if it is more than 0 then it will come to this line and it will calculate the square root and you should keep in mind that this square root function is not available in this standard input output library therefore you have to in include the math.h library also for this square root function to work. And finally, after calculating this square root, I am printing this x value, also the square root value which is y. And finally you can see I am again using the go to and what it will do is it will again go to this read level which is here. So this will create a problem in the program. I, will, I want to actually show that problem to you. It will go into an infinite loop and it will not be controllable. So let me run it for you so that you can understand. I am pressing F9 and here you can see it's waiting for me to provide a data. 
So I have to provide the data for x. Let me provide 3 here and press enter. Let me zoom it first. Here you can see I provided 3 and then press enter. You can see this is the value of 3 or x. As you can see here, this is x. So I'm getting the square root which is y. This is the square root of x which is 3. Now it's not ending this loop. It is waiting. So I, if I provide any other data, so 2 and press enter. It is calculating the square root for 2 as well. Then if I provide say 3 and press enter, again it is calculating, but it is not going out of this loop. So to terminate this, you can use the keyboard interrupt, which is control and C. But you can see sometimes it doesn't work. It is copying or again repeating the same code. You can see if I press control C, it is again doing the same thing. So in that case, what you can do is, you can manually close this program by clicking on this close button. So this is not a good way of using the go to statement because here I am using the go to here. It is going to this read label and finally after the execution of this statement also I am using the go to. So I will delete this line. I will delete it. Then if I show you how to use it, you will find the proper way of using the go to. I will press F9. Now if I run this, you can see it's asking me for the input. I am giving 3 and pressing enter. So here you see, this is the value of x3 and this is the square root 1.732051. And now it is going out of the program code. So now if I press enter, you, got, you have got to know the proper use of this go to. With the help of this, we can go to this read label because if the value of x is less than 0, I don't want to calculate the square root because it will not be possible. Therefore, what I am trying to do is I am checking the value of x to be positive and then I am continuing to this statement. If it is not greater than 0, I am telling the program control to go to this read level again. So this is how to do it. And I will show you another example where you will understand more about the go to statement. Let me show it to you. So here you can see I have taken two variables x and y of the floating data type. Then I am taking a count variable which is integer data type. And I am initially initializing the value of count to 1. And then I am telling the user to print five real values in a line. Then I am putting a label read and then what I am doing is I am taking user input of the five real values. So that we are not confused I have put a slash in here so that the control will go to the next line and here what I am doing is if I find that the value of x is less than zero then I am telling that the value is negative and then I am showing the value of count as well. You can see here. Then if the value of x is more than 0, it will go to this else block and it will calculate the square root and here it will print the value of x and also the value of y which is the square root and then it will increment the value of count to 1. So this will only be possible if the else block is true. Then only it will increment the value of count to 1. And you can see, finally I have given an if statement. If the value of count is less than or equal to 5, then it will go to this read level. And finally, when this entire code is done and the value of count becomes equal to or greater than 5 then it will go out and it will print end of computation. So what I am doing is I am taking 5 real values and then I am calculating the square root and displaying the output. When the count is more than 5 it will go out and it will print end of computation. Let me run it so that you can understand what is actually happening. I will press F9 and then you can see enter 5 real values in a line. 
first let me give only one value say 2 and press enter you can see it's giving me the value of 2 and the square root as well I will press 3 and press enter it gave me the result for the value 3 as well then I will press 5 and press enter it gave the result for 5 as well but it is continuing because you can see this go to is going to this read level here again and again this read level so as long as the count is not satisfied it will keep on going to the read level again and again so what I will do is I will provide the next one which is 9 say and press enter and it is giving the result so you can see there are four values given 2 3 5 and 9 and now I will give the fifth value which is say 7 and press enter now you can see the count has increased to 5 and this condition if count less than equal to 5 it become equal it becomes equal to 5 in this case therefore it prints the next print statement which is end of computation and it is finishing the process so this is how you can properly use the go to statement here with the help of this go to statement we are going to this level read and taking more input from the user as long as the count value is not equal to 5 so this is how you can do it we will be talking about decision making and looping statements in C so before starting the video I would like to request you people to please like our videos and share it with your friends and family and also subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you get notifications about our latest updates thank you so let's start with today's topic in looping a sequence of statements are executed until some conditions for termination of the loop are satisfied. A program loop therefore consists of two segments, one known as the body of the loop and the other known as the control statement. The control statement tests certain conditions and then directs the repeated execution of the statements contained in the body of the loop. So depending on the position of the control statement in the loop, a control structure may be classified either as the entry controlled loop or as the exit controlled loop. The flowcharts here will give you a better idea of entry controlled loops or exit controlled loops. So as you can see in the entry controlled loop the control conditions are tested before the start of the loop execution. If the conditions are not satisfied then the body of the loop will not be executed. In the case of an exit control loop the test is performed at the end of the body of the loop and therefore the body is executed unconditionally for the first time. The entry control loop and the exit control loop are also known as pre-test and post-test loops respectively. You have to keep in mind that the test conditions should be carefully stated in order to perform the desired number of loop executions. It is assumed that the test conditions will eventually transfer the control out of the loop. In case due to some reason it does not do so, the control sets up an infinite loop and the body is executed over and over again, which is a bad practice. So a looping process in general would include the following four steps. The first step is setting and initialization of a condition variable. Then the second step is execution of the statements in the loop. The third one is test for a specific value of the condition variable for execution of the loop. The fourth one is incrementing or updating the condition variable. So these are the four steps which are included in our looping process. So the test may be either to determine whether the loop has been repeated the specified number of times or to determine whether a particular condition has been met. In C language, there are three constructs for performing looping operations. They are the while statement, the do while statement and the for statement. 
we shall discuss the features and applications of each of these statements in our today's video. So let's start with the while statement. The simplest of all the looping structures in C is the while statement. The basic format of the while statement is as you can see in the picture while test condition then body of the loop. So the while is an entry controlled loop statement. The test condition is evaluated and if the condition is true then the body of the loop is executed. After execution of the body the test condition is once again evaluated and if it is true the body is executed once again. This process of repeated execution of the body continues until the test condition finally becomes false and the control is transferred out of the loop. On exit the program continues with the statement immediately after the body of the loop. So the body of the loop may have one or more statements. The braces are needed only if the body contains two or more statements. However, it is a good practice to use braces even if the body has only one statement. Otherwise, we might get confused. So it is better to use braces. So let us go on to the editor and look at an example to know more about the while loop. So here this is my editor and you can see I have already written an example of the while loop for you. So let me explain it line by line. We have included the standard input output header file and then this is my main function. And just because it is returning integer values, so I am using return 0. If you use void then you don't have to use this return 0 statement. Now you can see that I have initialized a value or a variable a which is of the integer data type to the value 20 and then I am checking with the while loop. You can see what I am doing is till the value of a is less than 30 I am printing the value of a and then inside the while loop I am incrementing the value of a using a++. So what I am trying to do is I am trying to print the values of a from 20 till it is less than 30. So in this case it should print from 20 till 29. As soon as the value becomes 30 it will go out of the condition of the while loop. So let me just provide one enter here so that it becomes good to understand. Okay. Now I will run it for you and show you what the output will be looking like. So here you can see, let me just zoom it for you. I initialized the value to 20, you can see here. Then I gave the condition which is while a less than 30, you can see here. So it's printing the values of a from 20 till you can see 29. All these are printed and as soon as the value of a becomes 30, it will go out of the control of the while loop. So this is a basic example of how to use the while loop. So here what is happening is I initialized a to 20 then I use the while loop and this is the condition a less than 30. So till the value of a is less than 30 it will be printing the values of a as you saw in the console and it will be doing it one step at a time. So it was 20 it will be incremented it will become 21 then it will be displayed and following till 29 it will be displayed and then it will go out of the while loop. So this is the basic example. Let me show you the output once again. So here you can see from 20 till 29 has been displayed and then it came out of the control of the while loop. So now let us move on to the next looping statement which is the do statement or the do while statement. So the while loop construct that we have discussed in the previous example makes a test of condition before the loop is executed. Therefore the body of the loop may not be executed at all if the condition is not satisfied at the very first attempt. On some occasions it might be necessary to execute the body of the loop before the test is performed. In such situations, we can do it with the help of the do statement. 
the form for the do statement can be as shown in the figure. You can see here do then body of the loop then while with the test condition. So what happens here is on, reach, on reaching the do statement the program proceeds to evaluate the body of the loop first. Then at the end of the loop this, the test condition in the while statement is evaluated. If the condition is true the program continues to evaluate the body of the loop once again. This process continues as long as the condition is true. When the condition becomes false, the loop will be terminated and the control goes to the statement that appears immediately after the while statement. So since the test condition is evaluated at the bottom of the loop, the do while construct provides an exit control loop and therefore the body of the loop is always executed at least once. So this is the basic difference between the while and the do while loops. In the while loop, only if the condition is true, then the body will be evaluated or executed. In the do statement, the body of the loop is always executed at least for one time. So let us go on to our editor and check an example of the do while statement. So here you can see this is my editor and I have this example for you. So here what I have done is I have taken a number num and this belongs to the in data type and I have initialized it to 1. You can see here I have given a comment initializing the variable and then I am starting the do while loop. What it will do is it will print the multiplication of that number with 2 and it will print the multiplication at least once then what I am doing is I am incrementing the value of the variable num by using this plus plus method and after that you can see the while statement occurs and here I am checking with the condition num less than equal to 10 so what will happen is from 1 till 10 will be checked and then it will provide the multiplication output. So in this case, in this do while case, what will happen? It will at least execute the body of the loop once. So let us check the output of this program code. I will be running it now. And you can see. Let me zoom it for you. You can see I am getting the answers 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 and 20. So when the value of num is 1 then I am getting 2 into 1 which is 2 and similarly till 2 into 10 it is printing then it is going out of the control of the 2 while loop. So let me just make certain changes with the program so that I can show you what actually is happening here. Let me take this to be say 11. So now you can see that it is not satisfying this condition which is num less than equal to 10 because 11 is not less than or equal to 10. But still even though I have given the value to be 11. It will at least execute this loop once. So let me run it now. You can see it's at least executing the body of the loop one time. So 11 into 2 will be 22. So this is the output for that. And after that while it is going to this while loop it is taking the condition and since it is not true it is going out of the control of the loop. So this is the difference between while and do while. In the do while the body will be executed at least once then it will go out of the control of the while loop if it does if it does not satisfy the condition so now let us move on to the next topic which is the for statement so let us first talk about simple for loops the for loop is another entry control loop that provides a more concise loop control structure the general form for the for loop is as you can see in the picture for initialization 
then the test condition, then increment or it may be decrement depending on our choice. Then we have the body of the loop. Now let me tell you the execution of the for statement. First, initialization of the control variables is done using assignment statements such as i equal to 1 and count equal to 0. Then the variables i and count are known as loop control variables. The second step is the value of the control variable is tested using the test condition. The test condition is a relational expression such as i less than 10 that determines when the loop will exit. So if the test condition is true, then it will either increment or decrement it and then it will be executing the body of the loop and then the third step comes. After executing the body of the loop, it will go to the beginning of the for loop and then it will again check the condition. If it satisfies, then it will go inside the body of the loop and then in the fourth step, it will be continuing the same process over and over again as long as the condition is true. Then in the fifth step, it will go out of the condition of the loop if the condition does not satisfy or it is finished. Then in the last step, it will go to the next statement. So let us check an example in the editor so that you can understand about the simple for loops in a better way. So here in my editor, you can see that I have written a certain program which will print the numbers from 1 to 10. And I will show you what I have actually done here. This is my main function. Let me press and enter. And now you can see I have initialized a variable int i. You have to remember in this case that whichever loop variables you are taking, you have to initialize those variables because otherwise your program will encounter errors. So this loop variable has to be initialized just because it is an integer value. Therefore, I have initialized it to the integer data type. And now I am using my for loop and here you can see the condition is the assignment operator which is i equal to 1. Then I am checking with this condition i less than 11. Then I am incrementing like this plus plus i or you can write i plus plus. So what happens is it will print the value of i as long as this condition is true. It should be less than 11. So in this case it will be printing from 1 till 10. Then after that it will go out of the body of the for loop because as soon as it becomes 11 it will not execute this body. It will go out. So let me run it for you so that you can check the output. Here you can see I am getting the values 1 till 10 displayed here. So this is what this program is doing. And finally, when the value of i becomes 11, it will go out of the body of the for loop. So this is a basic example of the for loop. Now let us move on to the next topic. Nesting of for loops or nested for loops. So nesting of loops that is one for statement with another for statement is allowed in C. And the nesting may continue up to any desired level. The loops should be properly indented so as to enable the reader to easily determine which statements are contained within each for statement. In C programming, it allows up to 15 levels of nesting. However, some common compilers permit more nestings of for loops. So let us move on to our editor so that we can check an example to know better about the nested for loops. So here in my editor, I have written a program to print a multiplication table. So you can see I have used nested for loops here. You can see this is one for loop and inside this for loop, I have another for loop as you can see here in red highlighted text. So let me show you what actually is happening with the table. I have initialized three variables n, i and j. So this i and j are the loop variables and n is the certain number for which I want the 
multiplication tables to be displayed in my console. So you can see all these are integer data types. So I have initialized them to the integer data type. And here I am asking the user to print the number for which they want the multiplication table to be displayed. Then with the help of the scanf statement here, I am taking the value of n from the user. And finally, to display the n tables, suppose up to 10, what I'm doing is I am using the for loop. This for loop is known as the outer loop. And this loop is known as the inner loop. There can be many numbers of nested loops. As I told you, uh, normally C programming allows up to 15 nested for loops and some other compilers allow more than that. So first what will happen is it will take the numbers from one, then it will increment the numbers till the value of n which the user will provide. Suppose the user provides five, then the multiplication table from one till five will be displayed. And I want to display 10 multiples here. So one ones are one till one, one, one tens are 10 will be displayed. Similarly, from five ones are five till five tens are 50 will be displayed. So the highest multiple is still 10 times. Therefore, I have taken this inner loop. You can see here it takes the value till 10. So J less than equal to 10 has been taken here. So what will happen is the outside for loop or the outer for loop will take the values from one till the value of n provided by the user. And for the inner for loop, it will calculate the multiplication from one till 10 multiples. And then it will be printing the value of that multiplication table. And as soon as the value reaches equal to the value provided by the user, it will print the multiplication table and then it will go out of the control of the for loop. And here I have used one printf statement where I have taken a escape character slash in so that I get the multiplication tables one line after the other so that the output looks good. Now let me run this program for you so that I can show you the multiplication table. So here you can see I'm pressing five and then pressing enter and you can see the multiplication table from one till five have been displayed here. You can see the one table, the two table and similarly till the five multiplication table has been displayed here. So you can provide any other number also. It will provide you the multiplication table till that number. So this is how the nested for loop is working here. And in this way, you can do many other operations using the nested for loops. Okay, now let us move on to our next topics where we will learn about using the break and the continue statements. The break and the continue statements come under the section jumps in loops. So loops perform a set of operations repeatedly until the control variable fails to satisfy the test condition. The number of times a loop is repeated is decided in advance and the test condition is written to achieve this. Sometimes when executing a loop, it becomes desirable to skip a part of the loop or to leave the loop as soon as a certain condition occurs. For example, the considered case of searching for a particular name in a list containing say 100 names. A program loop written for reading and testing the names 100 times must be terminated as soon as the desired name is found. So C programming permits a jump from one statement to another within a loop as well as a jump out of a loop. So let us check jumping out of a loop. An early exit from a loop can be accomplished by using the break statement or the go to statement. We have already seen the use of break statement in the switch statement in my earlier videos and the go to in the if else construct. These statements can also be used within while, do or for loops. So when a break statement is encountered inside a loop, the loop is immediately exited and the program continues with the statement immediately following the loop. 
So whenever the loops are nested, the brake would only exit from the loop containing it. That is, the brake will exit only a single loop. So let us take the use of the break statement and the continue statements. So here in my editor, you can see I have written a program which calculates the sum of numbers and it calculates the sum of maximum 10 numbers. And what I have done in this is whenever the user enters a negative number, the loop will terminate. To terminate the loop, I am using the break statement here as you can see. So let me explain the running of the program line by line. So here you can see, let me press and enter and then uh, you can see this is my main function and here I have initialized a variable i which is actually the loop variable i to my integer data type. Then I am taking two other variables, one is number and the other one is sum. So these two are of the double data type because the user may provide decimal numbers as well. So here I am initializing my for loop. You can see here. Let me press one more enter here so that you don't get confused. And then you can see it takes first value and it goes on till the 10th value. So I am calculating the sum of 10 maximum numbers. And then here you can see the increment operator is used then this for loop is actually to take the 10 values from the user and what happens is i have used the if statement you can see if the value of the number provided by the user is less than one or it is a negative number then i am using the break statement so it will con it will directly go out of the control of this for loop and it will terminate the loop otherwise if the number is positive, then it will calculate the sum and finally the sum will be displayed here. As you can see, by using of the printf statement, the sum has been displayed. So let me run it so that I can show you what actually happens. Just provide the numbers one by one. So I am providing normal numbers or positive numbers in the first case. I will provide one then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, then 6, then 7, 8, 9 and finally 10. So what happens is I am providing positive numbers. So in this case the loop is not terminated. It will calculate the value and it will display the sum. Let me press enter. You can see the sum has been displayed which is 55. Now the program has finished. So let me press enter and this was the normal case where I provided all positive values and now I will show you the reaction of the program when I provide negative values. As I told you here, whenever this if statement condition is not true or the number provided by the user is negative, then it will break from this loop. Let me show you what happens. I will run it again and in this case. Let me provide 2, then 3, then I will provide minus 1 and press enter. You can see as soon as I provided minus 1, it calculate the sum of the earlier two numbers 2 and 3 which is 5 and then it terminated the program because I gave a negative number which did not satisfy this if condition, if number less than 0.0. .0. So here in this case, this is not satisfying this condition or you can say the number here is less than zero and therefore the break statement has been executed and it is terminating the loop and it is displaying the sum for this two numbers two and three and then it is finishing the process. So I will press enter again and I will show you one more thing. I'm running it again. Let me provide directly a negative number say minus five and press enter. So you can see it does not calculate the sum. It simply goes out of the control of the loop. So this is how you can use the break statement. So now I will show you the use of the continue statement and show you the difference. This is the use of the continue statement. 
and it is a similar program to the earlier program but here what happens whenever the user provides a negative number so in this case what happens is whenever the user provides a negative number it will continue and it will not calculate the value of the negative number and it will not consider this negative number it will consider only the positive values and calculate the sum so this is the use of the continue statement what happens is it will take all the positive numbers and calculate the addition but in case the user provides a negative number it will continue and it will not calculate the sum of that negative number this continue statement again goes to the control of the beginning of the for loop so again the user will be prompted to provide a number till the count is 10 so i will show you how this works let me run it for you and now i will show you the difference here let me provide 1 2 3 and i will give a negative number now minus 2 and press enter so here you can see the difference when i am giving a negative number it is not going out of the loop it is going back to the control of this for loop again here and then it is asking me to provide a different number so here i will give 3 and press enter and then again i will give minus 9 press enter and then minus 5 press enter say 6 enter 5 enter let it be 7 then i will press enter and you can see it calculates the sum in this case so let us check it so 7 plus 5 is 12 12 plus 6 is 18 then 18 plus 3 is 21 21 plus 3 is 24 then plus 2 is 26 then plus 1 is 27 so you can see only for the positive values we are getting the sum and the negative values have been skipped so this is the use of the continue statement and as soon as the user provides a negative number it continues the program execution and it will go to the beginning of the for loop and ask for providing us a different number so this is how the continue is used with the help of this continue the program execution will continue but in the earlier example you saw that when you use the break statement it exits the loop so this is how you can use the break and the continue statements inside loops these are called the jumps in loops so you can jump into a loop or jump out of a loop we will be talking about finding the roots of a quadratic equation i will be showing you a c program with the help of which you can find the roots of a quadratic equation but before starting the video i would like to request you people to please like and share our videos and also subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you get notifications about our latest updates thank you so let's get started so as i said today i will be showing you how to find the roots of a quadratic equation with the help of a c program so a general form of a quadratic equation is like this ax square plus bx plus c is equal to 0 where a b and c are the coefficients so to find the roots of a quadratic equation first of all you have to know the formula the formula is as you can see on the screen before that we need to know something we need to find a term so that we can find the roots of a quadratic equation the term is called the discriminant which is represented as this b square minus 4 into a into c so this term is known as the discriminant or this expression is known as the discriminant b square minus 4 into a into c so there are three conditions depending on which the roots of a quadratic equation can be evaluated the three conditions are b square minus 4ac or the discriminant less than 0 b square minus 4ac equal to 0 and b square minus 4ac greater than 0. So whenever the discriminant is less than 0, the roots are imaginary. And whenever the discriminant is equal to 0, the roots are real and equal. And whenever the discriminant is more than 0, then 
the roots are real and distinct so as you can see here these are the three conditions discriminant less than zero means the roots are imaginary discriminant equal to zero means the roots are real and equal and discriminant greater than zero means the roots will be real and distinct so let us go on to the editor so that i can show you the program with the help of which we will be calculating the roots of the quadratic equation so here i am on my editor and you can see i have already written a program for you and this is the header file math.h which has to be included in our header files so that we can use the square root function which is included in the math.h header file you can see here i have used the square root function so let me show you and explain you the program line by line here this is my main function and here i have taken a double data type and taken these variables which are a b c then the discriminant then the root 1 root 2 and if the discriminant is less than 0 then i have also taken the real part and the imaginary part you can see here and therefore I am taking the printf function with the help of which I am telling the user to enter the coefficients of a, b and c. And then finally with the help of the scanf function I am taking the input from the user and storing them in the variables a, b and c as you can see here. Then here I am calculating the discriminant b square minus 4 into a into c and also I am printing the value of the discriminant with the help of this print function. And now comes the three conditions as I told you earlier. The condition for real and different roots. As I told you, if the value of discriminant is greater than zero, then the roots will be real and different. And here I'm calculating the root one, which is minus b plus square root of discriminant divided by 2a. And this is the formula for root two minus b minus discriminant square root divided by 2a then i am printing the roots one by one then finally just because the roots are real and different i am printing this statement as well the roots are real and different and then if this condition is not satisfied then i am using the else if where the discriminant value is equal equal zero in this case the roots are real and equal so the formula is minus b divided by 2 into a for both the roots then here i am printing both the roots and finally if this condition is not true then finally the discriminant value will be less than zero so here what will happen i will print the real part and the imaginary part as you can see here so the real part is minus b divided by 2a and the imaginary part is the square root of the discriminant and then divide by twice a just because it is an imaginary part you can see that i have taken the minus sign in front of the discriminant and finally i am printing the real and the imaginary parts as you can see here with the help of this two printf statements so this is the complete logic behind this program and now i will run it so that i can show you all the three different conditions where we will be calculating the roots of this quadratic equation. So let me run it for you. So I'm just zooming it for you so that you can see it better. Let us try with the first condition where the value of discriminant is equal to zero. So here I will give the input see the value of a is 1 then the value of b is 2 and the value of c is 1 and i will press enter and you can see here discriminant is 0 and therefore as i said the roots are root 1 equal to root 2 equal to minus 1 so here it prints the roots are real and equal and now let us go on to check the next condition which is the roots are imaginary that is 
b square minus 4ac is less than 0. Let me run it again and let me zoom it and here I will take the value of a to be 1, value of b to be 2 and the value of c to be 3 and then let me press enter. You can see b square minus 4ac is less than 0 therefore root 1 is in the form of a plus ib as you can see here minus 1 plus 1.41 1 into i and root 2 equal to minus 1 minus 1.41 1 into i and it prints the roots are imaginary. This is because it satisfies this condition. The value of discriminant is minus 8 which is less than 0 and now let us see the final condition which is the value of discriminant is greater than 0. Then the roots are real and distinct or unique. Let me run it again. Let me zoom it and let me show you the third output. Let me take the value of a to b minus 1, value of b to be 3 and the value of c to be 6 and press enter. You can see here the discriminant value is positive and therefore the roots are real and distinct. You can see they are different unique roots root 1 equal to minus 1.37 and root 2 equal to 4.37. Therefore the roots are real and different. Now so this way you can calculate the roots of a quadratic equation where I told you there are three conditions discriminant equal to 0, less than 0 and greater than 0. When it is equal to 0 the roots are real and equal, when it is less than 0 the roots are imaginary, when it is more than 0 or greater than 0 the roots are real and different. And let me summarize with the formula. The total formula is as you can see in the screen here root 1 equal to or all total let me show you all total minus b plus minus square root of b square minus 4ac divided by 2 into a. Out of this if you have to extract root 1 and root 2 you can write like this root 1 equal to minus b plus b square minus 4ac square root divided by 2a and root 2 equal to minus b minus square root of b square minus 4ac divided by 2 into a. So this is how you can calculate the roots of a quadratic equation with the help of a C program. I will be talking about how to compute the binomial coefficients with the help of a C program. So before starting the video, I would like to request you people to please like and share our videos with your friends and family and also subscribe to our channel Codus Arcade and press the bell icon so that you receive notifications about our latest updates. Thank you. So let's get started. As I told you, to compute the binomial coefficients, we need to first know about a formula of the binomial coefficients. As you can see here, this is the formula for the binomial coefficients. It is ncr is equal to n factorial divided by n minus r factorial into r factorial. Suppose we have taken the values for n and r to be 6 and 4 respectively, then the formula will be like this ncr is equal to 6c4 is equal to 6 factorial divided by 6 minus 4 factorial into 4 factorial. Then if you calculate the result you will find that it is 360. So this is the basic formula as you can see here in the screen ncr is equal to n factorial divided by n minus r factorial into r factorial. So let us go on to the editor so that I can show you the program with the help of which we can calculate the binomial coefficients. So I'm going to my editor now and you can see here I have already written down the program for you. 
So this is the header file and this is my main file and you can see I have taken three variables which are of the integer data type and there are four variables which are of the long integer data type. Then I have used the printf function and I am printing this enter the value of n and r and then with the help of the scanf function I am taking the input of the values n and r from the user. Then initially I am taking the values of x, y and z to be 1. Let me tell you this x is for n factorial, y is for n minus r factorial and z is for the final one which is r factorial. So I am calculating all the values x, y and z individually so that finally I can use the formula ncr and I can use the separate formula which is n factorial divided by n minus r factorial into r factorial. Therefore, I have individually taken x, y and z as you can see here. So, first of all, I am using a for loop to calculate x. As you can see here, just because n factorial comes in the beginning, I am taking i equal to n, i greater than equal to 1 because it cannot be 0 and then I am decrementing the value of i. So then I am calculating the value of x which is x equal to x into i. So it will go in a reverse order just because I am decrementing it. Suppose it is 4 then it will be like 4 into 3 into 2 into 1. So this is the n factorial part. Now let us go on to the n minus r factorial part. For that I have taken i value to be n minus r as you can see here and then I am decrementing it one by one. So this way it will give the product and it will calculate the values in the reverse order like 4 into 3 into 2 into 1. It can be any number. It depends on you. So let us now move on to the final one which is r factorial. So for that I have taken z as you can see here. So here also I am taking a for loop and then I am doing this operation and you can see it's decremented i is minus minus. So it will calculate the multiplication in reverse order. Finally, you can see here this is the ncr variable which is of the longing data type and here I am calculating this n factorial divided by n minus r factorial into r factorial but instead of that I am taking x, y and z because these three variables represent my n factorial, n minus r factorial and r factorial x represents n factorial, y represents n minus r factorial and z represents r factorial. Then I am using the printf function to print my value of n, value of r and finally the value of my ncr which is the binomial coefficient. So let me run it for you so that you can check the result. Here let me zoom it for you. I am taking the value of n to be 4 and the value of r to be 2 and let me press enter. You can see I am getting the result which is ncr or 4c2 is equal to 12. Let me take it for the one I told you earlier which is 6 and 4 and I said the answer is 360. Let me do it for you. I am taking the value of n to be 6 and the value of r to be 4 and let me do it now. As you can see here, the value of NCR is 360. So this is how you can compute binomial coefficients with the help of a C program. I will be talking about plotting of the Pascal's triangle with the help of a C program. So what is a Pascal's triangle? A Pascal's triangle can be as shown in the figure. Here you can see depending on the number of rows we can have a different result and as you can see here the first row starts with 1 then followed by 1 and 1 and then the next row will have 1 and 1 and these two ones will be added and in between we will have a 2. Similarly in the next row we will have 1 and then 1 and 2 will be added and then we have 3 and then again 
2 and 1 will be added. We have 3 and then finally we have 1, 1. So the triangle goes on like this depending on the number of rows you have. The value will be added on and it will keep on continuing. So now that you know the idea of how to print this triangle, let us move on to the editor so that I can show you a program with the help of which you can print this Pascal's triangle onto the console or the terminal. So let's move on to the editor. So here you can see I have already written down a program for you to print the Pascal's triangle. And this is the header file followed by my main function. And here you can see this is a variable rows, which is of the integer data type. This will have the number of rows. And then I have this variable, which is coefficient. And this is initiated to one. And then I have this space variable, which is for the spaces that we will require while we are printing the Pascal's triangle. And I have this i and j as my loop variables in order to provide the spaces. And then I am using the printf function so that I can print the statement, enter the number of rows and with the help of the scanf function, I am taking the input of the number of rows from the user and storing it into my rows variable. And then after this, I am again using a printf function so that I can go on to the control in the next line. Now I am going on to the logic inside the program so that I can print the Pascal's triangle. So this for loop you can see, this is the outer for loop, which is for i less i equal to zero, i less than number of rows, i plus plus. And inside this, I have one inner for loop where you can see I have initiated the value of the space to be one. Then this actually is space less than equal to rows minus i. So what happens is it will keep on printing the spaces according to this logic. And finally, I am incrementing the space by using this space plus plus. So with the help of this line of code, I am printing the empty spaces. You can see here, print empty spaces. And I have given two spaces so that I get the desired output of the triangle. And after that, to print the values, as you can see, I had taken the coefficient to be one. And finally, I'm using another for loop where I'm using this conditional operator. You can see this and I'm checking these conditions z equal to equal to zero and i equal to equal to zero. Then the coefficient will be is equal to one because as you saw in the triangle, in the two sides, I want ones to be printed, right? Otherwise, I want the values to be added. So to add those values, as you saw, I got one, then one, one, then one, two, one, then I got one, three, three, one, and so on. What I can do is you have to remember this formula. The formula is coefficient equal to coefficient into i minus j plus one divided by j. So with the help of this formula only, we can implement the Pascal's triangle. Otherwise, it won't be working. So with the help of this formula, we can print the Pascal's triangle. Then after that, I'm printing this value. Printf percentage 4d. Then I'm printing the coefficient as you can see here. And after that, just because I want the control to go to the next line, I am giving this print statement outside this control of the for loop so that I can go on to the next line. As you can see here, I have given two slash ends with the help of which I will be going to the next next line. After that, I am ending my for loop which was the outer for loop. And finally, I am giving this return zero statement because I'm returning integer values. And finally, I'm concluding my main function. So this is the program for printing the Pascal's triangle. Now I will run it for you so that you can get an idea of how to print the Pascal's triangle. Let me run it for you. Uh, let me just zoom it. 
And now let me give the number of rows to be five and press enter. So here you can see, this is the Pascal triangle. In the sides, we have one printed. And in the first row, it is one. And in the second row, it is one and one. And in the third row, you can see, this is the one. And again, one plus one is two. So we are getting two here. And finally, again one. And in the fourth row, one is at the extremes. And then one plus two is three. Two plus one is again three. Then again, we get one. Again, in the fifth row, we are getting one. Then one plus three is four. Three plus three is six. And then three plus one is again four. And then in the extremity, we have one. So depending on the number of rows, you will get the output like this. So let me just press enter and let me run it once again so that I can show you for more number of rows. Let us take the number of rows to be eight and let me zoom it. And now I'll press enter. And now you can see, depending on the number of rows you provide, you will get a bigger triangle. So this is how you can print the Pascal's triangle with the help of a C program. And in that, you have to remember this formula coefficient equal to coefficient into i minus j plus 1 divided by j. So with the help of this only, we can implement the other different values that are changing depending on the number of rows. So this is the logic behind printing the Pascal's triangle. Hello everyone, welcome to our channel Polis Arcade. In today's video, we will be talking about arrays in C. Before starting with today's topic, let me request you to please share and like our videos with your friends and family and also subscribe to our channel Codis Arcade so that you get notifications about our latest updates. So let's get started. So far, we have used only the fundamental data types, namely character, int, float, double, and variations of int and double. Although these data types are very useful, they are constrained by the fact that a variable of these types can store only one value at a given time. Therefore, they can be used only to handle limited amounts of data. In many applications, however, we need to handle a large volume of data in terms of reading, processing and printing. To process such large amounts of data, we need a powerful data type that would facilitate efficient storing, accessing and manipulation of data items. C language supports a derived data type known as array that can be used for such applications. So what is an array? An array is a fixed size sequenced collection of elements of the same data type. It is simply a grouping of like type data. In simplest form, an array can be used to represent a list of numbers or a list of names. Some examples where the concept of an array can be used are as follows. List of temperatures recorded every hour in a day or a month or a year. List of employees in an organization. List of products and their cost sold by a store. Test scores of a class of students, list of customers and their telephone numbers, or else table of daily rainfall data and so on. Since an array provides a convenient structure for representing data, it is classified as one of the data structures in C. There are many other data structures like lists, queues and trees. We will also be discussing about this in our next upcoming videos. So we will be mainly talking about arrays in this video. So there are many types of arrays. We can use arrays to represent not only simple lists of values, but also tables of data in two, three or more dimensions. In this and the upcoming videos, we will be discussing how to use it to create and apply the following types of arrays, which are one-dimensional arrays, two-dimensional arrays, and multi-dimensional arrays. So let us first talk about one-dimensional arrays. 
Okay, let me give you an example. Suppose I want to add three numbers. Let me think about three variables. In my mind, I might be thinking of A, B and C as the three variables. And what did you think about? You might also have thought about A, B and C, right? Or else we can think about X, Y and Z. Now the question is, why are we only thinking about A, B, C or X, Y, Z? The reason behind this is, A, B, C or X, Y, Z follows a certain pattern and it is very easy to remember this kind of patterns. So, whenever we think of variables in a pattern, then it is very easy to remember those patterns because it continues in a serial number or a pattern. Suppose A, B, C, D, E or you can say W, X, Y, Z, etc. It becomes very easy to remember. Now, if I ask you to add suppose 100 numbers, in that case, it will be very difficult to think of 100 variables at the same time because it will be very time consuming and it will fill the program with clutters and it will be very messy, right? So, what we can do is, in this kind of situations, we can use arrays. So, let me show you how an array looks like. A array can be represented like this. It will have the data type. Then, we will write the variable name followed by square brackets. And then, we can give the number of elements. And you can either assign the length of the array at the beginning or you can leave it blank. It can be of two types. Now the question is, if I assign the length of the array, then it will be something like this. This will have 10 number of elements as you can see in the figure. Now the question arises, how we can access the elements in this array. For that, we have the idea or process of indexing. The indexing in C programming starts from zero. As you can see, the first element will have the index zero and followed by it, it will go on till the last number. So if we are having 10 elements, then the last number will have the index 9. 10 minus 1 is equal to 9 because it is starting from 0. So if we want to access the first element, we can write a of 0. And if we want to access the last element, we can use a of 9. So this is how you can access the elements in an array. Now, let us move on to the editor so that we can understand more about this one dimensional array. I am going to my editor now. So as I told you, I will write my main function. And followed by this curly braces here, I will assign the array. And in this program, I will show you how to calculate the average of 10 numbers. For that, I will be using a one-dimensional array, which is also like a list. So this is the syntax of writing an array, int a of, you have to give curly braces. And inside it, I will assign the length of the array, which is 10. Then, I will give the colon. Now, as I told you, to access the first item in the array, you can do it by using the indexing, like a of 0. So like this, you can access all the items in the array. Now you can assign values to the elements of the array like this. If, if I say a of 0 equal to 56, in this way, I can assign values to the elements of the array. And if I say a of 9 is equal to 90, in this way, I am assigning a value 90 to the last element of the array or the 10th element of the array. So for the time being, let me take an input from the user for all the elements. For that, what I have to do is, I will use the printf function and here I will write enter the 10 elements one by one. And now I will give a escape character slash in so that I get the output in the next line. 
and please remember you have to keep the semicolon here now the question is how do i take the input from the user for that i will be using a for loop for i equal to 0 but the question is that i have to now assign this variable otherwise i will be encountering an error so for that i am taking the i variable so now i have 10 elements so i can do it in two ways i equal to 0 i less than 10 i can write or else i can write i less than equal to 9 both are correct so i am using the first one i less than 10 then semicolon i plus plus and now i will be taking the input from the user for that i will use the scanf function and here i will take the quotes and i will write percentage d comma and this is the ampersand this is for the address and here i will write a of i so in this way the elements entered by the user will be stored in the variable a which is an array one by one now i have to give the semicolon so in this way i will be getting all the elements input from the user and will be storing them in the array a now first of all to find the average i have to calculate the sum of all the numbers or the elements in the array for that i am taking one more variable which is sum so for this i have to take another for loop here also just because there are 10 elements i will be using the same logic i equal to 0 i less than 10 i plus plus and here i will be using this logic sum equal to sum plus a of i so in this way all the elements will be added one by one because of this for loop it will start from the first element and it will keep on calculating till it goes on to the last element but for that initially i have to initiate the sum value to zero which i will be doing now as you can see here i have done it to zero now i have to calculate the average for that let me take another data type which is float and i will take the average variable and semicolon and after this ending of the for loop i will take average equal to sum divided by 10.0 why have i taken 10.0 because when we divide integer by integer we will be getting an integer value i want it to satisfy for float also that's why i am taking 10.0 i am taking i have taken 10.0 because i have 10 number of elements and the formula for average is sum of the number of elements divided by the number of elements so now i will print the average by using the printf function and here just because my data type is float i have to use percentage f so i will write the average is percent f and then i will give the comma and call my average variable so now it's done so this is the total code now let me run it for you so that i can show you the output i'm running it you can see there is an error okay i have to give a semicolon here i've given a comma sorry for that now let me run it once again and here also i have to give one semicolon you people need to remember that you have to give semicolon everywhere 
so let me run it again and yes it's asking me to provide the elements one by one let me zoom it for you and i'm giving the elements one two three four five six seven eight nine and say ten and press enter you can see it's calculating the average which is 5.5000 so i'll press enter and this is how you can calculate the average using an array this is a one dimensional array in my next videos i will be talking about two dimensional arrays and multi dimensional arrays as well so here i want to tell you one more thing you have to remember the syntax as you can see here array is represented by the variable name and followed by the length of the array and if you don't assign this length then you can put as many numbers as you want but if you assign this length then you have to provide 10 elements or less than 10 elements if you provide 10 elements then it's okay if you provide less than 10 elements Suppose if you are providing two elements, then first two elements will be the elements provided by you and the other eight elements will be by default zero. And if you provide more than 10 elements, then you will encounter errors. So this you have to keep in mind. So this is how you can work with arrays. In today's video, I will be talking about arrays in C programming. In my earlier video, I have already discussed about arrays. So in that video, I told you about one dimensional arrays. In this video, I will be talking about the remaining topics. So before starting the video, I would like to request you people to please like and share our videos with your friends and family. And also subscribe to our channel Codus Arcade and press the bell icon so that you get notifications about our latest updates. Thank you. So let's get started. As I told you, my today's topic will be arrays in C programming, as you can see here. So I told you there are three types of arrays, which are one dimensional arrays, two dimensional arrays, and three dimensional, or it can be multi dimensional arrays. In our earlier video, we talked about one dimensional arrays. So today we will be talking about two dimensional arrays. So what are two dimensional arrays? Two dimensional arrays are used to represent tables or matrices. So let me give you an example so that you can understand better. Here in the figure you can see this is a matrix. It has rows and columns. There are particularly two rows and four columns here. And in this type of array also, we have the method of indexing with the help of which we can refer to a certain row and column. So as you can see here, the columns will have the indexing like this 0, 1, 2 and 3. And at the same time, the rows will also have the indexing like 0 and 1. Because there are four columns, Therefore, indexing will start from 0 and end at 3. And because there are two rows, the indexing will start at 0 and end at 1. Suppose we want to represent the marks of two students. So in that case, we can do it in this fashion, as you can see here. So 10, 20, 30 and 40 are the marks of student 1 and 50, 60, 70 and 80 maybe the marks of another student which is student 2. So let us move on to the editor so that I can show you how to write a program on representing this matrix or table with the help of two dimensional arrays in C programming. So now I am moving to my editor and here you can see I will start with the mean function and then I press enter and give the curly braces. So here starts our main function. Now I will take the array variable name, let it be marks. Here you have to follow this syntax. 
you can see here I am using two square brackets and inside that I will give the row number and the column number as I showed you in the example. So this is how you can do it. Now I will press the equal sign and now I have to give the elements inside this array. So here I have to give one more curly braces so that I can provide the elements. So here you can see I will be giving the numbers as 10, 20, 30, 40. So this finishes my first row. Now I will write the second row. Say 50, 60, 70, 80. So now I am done with the assigning of the elements. Now to print these elements, I need two for loops. So for that I have to initiate two loop variables. Let it be i and j. I am giving one comma. Here I will give i comma j. So these are my loop variables. Then finally I have to give my semicolon. So now I am ready with my assigning of variables. Now to represent this as I told I have to use two for loops which is also known as the nested for loop. So I am writing the syntax for i equal to 0 semicolon i less than 2 this is for the number of rows semicolon i plus plus sorry small i i plus plus then here I am opening the curly brackets so that it becomes easy to understand and inside it I will take another for loop and here I will take j equal to 0 this is for the number of columns and semicolon j less than 4 because it will start from 0 and go on till 3 0 1 2 3 so there are 4 columns and then I will give the semicolon then j plus plus and here inside this for loop I will again try to print the array now so for that I will use the print printf function and here I will write person d comma then I will write marks and here you should notice that I am writing i and then here j. So in this way I will be able to represent the marks. So here I have to give the semicolon to end it. And as soon as I have written the first line, I want to give it. I want to give the control to the next line. So for that what I will do is I will take one more printf statement and here I will give an escape, escape sequence which is flash in. So this will give the control to the next line. And now with the help of this I can print the two dimensional array. So let's run my program and see whether it is correct or not. I am running it. So now you can see on running it, I am getting the output but there is no space in between the elements. For that what I can do is, I can, I can give one space here so that I get a proper output. Now let me run it once again. And now you can see there is a space between the marks of the two students 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 and 18. So this is how you can do it. So this is a basic example of two dimensional array. You can see here, this is the syntax. This is the data type. This is the variable name. And this just because it is two dimensional, I'm writing two square brackets and inside it, I'm giving the row and the column values. So this is how it is done. In today's video, we will be talking about the next topic which is character arrays and strings.
So, before starting the video, I would like to request you people to please like and share our videos with your friends and family and also subscribe to our channel Codus Arcade and press the bell icon so that you get notifications regarding our latest updates. Thank you. So let's get started. As I said, our today's topic is character arrays and strings. So let me start with the definition of a string. So a string can be defined as an array of characters. Or we can also say that a string is a collection of characters. So as you can see in the screen, A is a character and it can be denoted like this inside quotes. B is also a character and it can be denoted like this inside quotes B. And if we have to define a string, then as I said earlier, string is a collection of characters. So, here as you can see, H is a character and hi is a string inside quotes. So, as I said, if we write a collection of characters inside quotes, this will be termed as a string. So, let us see or learn how we can declare strings. So let us move on to the declaration part of strings. As you can see in the screen, the declaration can be like this. Care string name followed by the length. Here care is the data type and then we have the name of the string followed by the length. And let me give you an example. Suppose char care string name followed by inside square brackets 100. So this example represents a string of 100 characters. The length can be different depending on our choice. So as we know the declaration part and as I have showed you in the figure, in case of strings we always use the character data type. So, in the example, you can see that we have used the character data type. Now, after the declaration part, let us move on to the initialization part. So, here there are two ways to initialize strings. The first way is using single character constant. Let us check an example so that I can tell you better about this topic. So, here is the example, char a of 10 is equal to inside curly braces, hello. And just see how I have written the example, h, e, l, l, o. All these individual characters are inside quotes and they are separated by commas. And finally, at last, we have slash zero inside quotes. This slash zero is known as the null character. This null character is actually a character which marks the end of the string. It tells the compiler that the string has ended. So this is the first way of initialization of strings. As I told you, it is using single character constant. Now let us move on to the second type of initialization of strings. The second type is using string constant. So let me show you another example so that you can understand the second type. The example is char a of 10 is equal to inside quotes hello. Here we are using a string constant. So, in this case, we do not have to use curly braces or we do not have to separate individual characters inside quotes. We can write the entire string inside quotes. So, this type of initialization of strings is known as initialization using string constant. And 
please remember in case of string constant we do not use the null character because the null character is placed automatically by the compiler we do not have to place it so after we have known about initialization of the strings let us move on to the next topic which is accessing of strings so as we already know from our previous videos we can access integers with the help of percentage d similarly we can access floats with the help of percentage f in case of string also we can use this method which is percentage s with the help of percentage s we can access strings so as you know how to access strings initiate strings and declare strings let us move on to the editor so that i can show you a simple example with the help of which you can understand about strings more so now i will be going on to my editor here i am inside my editor and now i will be writing the program for you let me write the header file which is hash include stdio dot h then i will write my main function and inside my main function i will write the data type for my string which is char then i will take a of length suppose 10 then i will declare it as hello okay and then i will give the semicolon then this will be a simple example so that i can show you how to print this string now i will use the printf statement and i will print the given string is is percent as i told you earlier it is s and then i will give comma a and semicolon so with the help of this i can print the string so let me run my program so that i can show you the output i will run it for you now so as you can see here it prints the given string is hello so this is how you can print it but let me tell you one more thing in this case i am using the string constant but i will also show you the other one which is the single character constant for that i have to change the syntax a little bit i will give a curly braces and inside it i will separate each character with the help of quotes let me show you how i am giving comma and again i will give quotes so with the help of quotes we can separate each single character constant and now let me show you one interesting thing as i told you the null character defines that the string has ended and it tells the compiler this is the end of the string now let me assign the null character here slash 0 so this is the null character i will give a comma and after that this o i will keep at last as you can see here so now as i told you this null character will actually tell the compiler that the string has ended so when i print this i get only four characters which is h e l and l because this null character will be the end of this string and this o will not be printed so let me just run the program so that i can show you the output as you can see here it says the given string is h e l l 
So as I told you, this null character will define the end of the string. Now if I put this O before this null character, and give a comma here. Now you will see that hello will be printed. Let me run it. You can see here hello is printed. So this is how we can use single character constants or string constants and we can print the strings. So this is a basic example. In today's video, we will be talking about the topic reading a series of words from a terminal using the scanf function. For this, we will be using arrays. So before starting the video, I would like to request you people to please like and share our videos and also subscribe to our channel Codus Arcade and press the bell icon so that you can receive notifications about our latest updates. Also, share our videos with your friends and family and those who are willing to learn programming. So let's get started. As I told, today's topic is reading a series of words from a terminal using the scanf function. So let us directly go on to the editor so that I can show you the program. I'm going to my editor now and here I will start with the main function. So inside the main function, I will create my variables. So I will take the character data type and then I will take the variables. Say word one and the size should be say 20. Similarly, I will take four or three other variables. Word two, 20. word 3 20 and word 4 the length is also 20 in this case then i will give the semicolon and i have to remove this semicolon and give a comma here so now i have declared the variables which are arrays then here i will use the printf statement and I will write enter the words one by one and then I will give the slash in so that I can go on to the next line. So here to take the user input from the user and store it into the variables which are word1, word2, word3 and word4, I have to use the scanf function. So let us use it, scanf and now inside quotes, as I told you in my earlier video, to read the characters or the strings actually, we have to use percentage s and then I will give a comma and here I will call my word1 variable. Similarly, I will do it for the other ones as well. I will just copy this code and then I will paste it three times. So here I just have to change it for word2, word3 and word Four. Then after that, I will use a printf statement so that I can take the control to the next line. For that, I will use slash n. So here, I have to give a semicolon and also in all the earlier cases, I did not give the semicolons. Let me give it for you. So now it's done. And now, let me print the words for that i have to use the print statement once again 
and here let me print the words for that i will write word 1 is equal to percent s as i told for strings it is percent is s then i will use the next line slash in then again i will write word 2 is equal to similarly i have to write percentage s then i will take the next line command which is the escape character slash in then here after this i will give comma and then i will call my word 1 and word 2 word 2 so this is done and let me just copy it and paste it here so that i can change it for the word 3 and word 4 this will be word 3 and this will be word 4 and here also let me change it word 3 and word 4 so this is it guys this is the total code now here i will run it so that i can show you the output this will actually read a series of words from the terminal using the scanf function so let me run it and it says there is an error yes you can see here there is no semicolon so there is an error let me run it once again now and okay you can see it's asking me to enter the words one by one let me give the words let me give the name of our channel say coders then arcade then we are learning about c programming right so let me write c and then programming so when i press enter you can see that word 1 equal to coders word 2 equal to arcade word 3 equal to c and word 4 equal to programming so this is how we can read a series of words from the terminal using the scanf function so here i have given it in different lines let me show you what happens if i give all the words in a single line i will press enter and let me run it once again the shortcut is f9 and let me zoom it to zoom it you should hold the control and scroll the mouse up button so now let me give the words in a single line say i will write the same thing coders arcade c programming and if i press enter now you can see even if i give the user input in the same line i am getting word 1 equal to coders word 2 equal to arcade word 3 equal to c and word 4 equal to programming so it doesn't matter if we give the input in the same line or different lines it will be stored in the variables word 1 word 2 word 3 and word 4 so in this way you can read a series of words from the terminal using the scanf function as i have shown you in this program you can see these are the scanf functions that i used so let me zoom the program for a little bit so that you can see the program code clearly so this is my entire program code so this is how you can read a series of characters from a terminal using the scanf function and here we are using the character data type and we are using word 1 word 2 word 3 and word 4 which are arrays as variables so if we take more variables we can read more number of words in today's video we will be learning about how to perform linear search in c programming so before starting the video i would like to request you people to please like and share our videos with your friends and family and also subscribe to our channel codes arcade and press the bell icon so that 
to receive notifications about our latest updates. Thank you. So let's get started. As I told, our today's topic is performing linear search in C programming. So let's start. Let us take five elements in an array. So if we take five elements in an array, the array size will be five. So this gives us our first variable, which is n. So here, in this case, I am taking the size to be 5. So n is equal to 5. Now let us take the 5 elements. So let me take the elements as 12, 15, 16, 17 and 3. So these elements will take up the index like this. a of 0, a of 1, a of 2, a of 3 and a of 4. Since the indexing starts from 0 and there are 5 elements, it will start from 0 and it will end at 4. So a of 0 will be 12 and the last element will be a of 4, which is 3. Now, how to do the linear search? For that, we have to take a number. So let us search the number 17 in our case. So for that, we have to take the next variable which is key and as I said we are searching the number 17 the value of key here will be 17 and let us take another variable flag which will be initialized to 0 and as soon as we find our number the flag value will be changed or updated to 1 but if we don't find the value of flag it will be 0 itself. So the key value will be compared to all the elements in the array. First of all key will be compared with a of 0 then a of 1 then a of 2 and as you can see here the key is 17 and it is equal to the element a of 3 in our case as you can see in the array. Now as soon as we find the key and it is matched with the element in the array, what will happen is we will have to update the value of flag to 1. Then we have to get out of the loop. For that in C programming, we have the break statement. With the help of the break statement, we will come out of the loop. And then we will compare the value stored in the flag variable. If the value of flag is 0, then we will say that the number that we were searching was not found and the search was unsuccessful. But if the value of flag is 1, then we can say that the number which we were searching in our array has been found and we will print the search has been successful. So that is it guys. This is the logic behind the program. Let us move on to the editor so that I can show you how to write the program and execute it. So now I will be moving on to the editor. So let's get started here as I am in my editor. First I will write a comment. Search. And I will close the comment box. And then I will start with the header files. stdio.h and conio.h. After that, I will start with my main function. And inside the main function, I will start with initializing the variables. Here, first of all, I will take the array which is a of let the size be 10 then I will take the size of the array which is the variable n and then I will take the variable key as I mentioned then I will take the flag and 
I will initialize it to 0. And finally, I will take the loop variable to iterate over the loop, which will be i. Then I will give the semicolon and I will now write the print statement. Here, I will tell the user to enter the array limit or size. Then I will use the slash in so that I can take the output in the next line. Then I will use the scanf function so that I can take the input from the user. I will use the percentage %d to take the integer value from the user and then I will store it in the variable n. And after this, I will again use the printf statement so that I can take all the elements in the array one by one. So for that, I will use the print statement and I will tell enter percent %d so that I can read the n value elements one by one. And after this, I will again use the slash n so that I can print the input given by the user in the next line. And after this, I will give the n variable. So with the help of this, now I will use a for loop. And here, I will take the loop variable i equal to 0 then I will take the condition i less than n which will be less than the size of the array because it starts from 0 then it can, it can go on till 4 and we will be getting the number of elements. I have to give a semicolon here and here also then I will increment the value of i. Here, I will take a curly braces and here inside the curly braces, I will use the scanf function so that I can read the input from the user. I will write percent %d, comma, and a of i so that I can store the numbers provided by the user in the array. So after that again, I will use the printf statement so that I can ask the user which number he or she wants to search. So here I will write enter the number to be searched. And again I will use the slash n so that I can go on to the next line and here I will use the scanf function then I will write percent %d this value will be stored in the key variable Then here, now comes the logic of the program. Here, I will use the for loop and the condition will be the same, i is equal to 0, i less than n, i plus plus, now I will use the if statement and here I will check if a of i equal equal the key value then inside the braces I will write as I said flag value will be updated to 1 
and then as soon as we have found the number we will break out of this loop and finally after i come out of this for loop here now i will take the value of flag if the value of flag is 1 then i will print it is successful or else if it is not 1 then i will print it is not successful so we can do it in this manner if inside brackets we will write flag that means if the value of flag is 1 then inside the braces I will print number found searches successful then I will give the control to the next line by using the slash in and here I will use the semicolon and after this I will go out of this if and I will use the else for the other condition here inside brackets I will print the opposite which is number not found searches unsuccessful or you can see search field whatever you want that doesn't matter full stop and here also I will give the control to the next line so that it looks it looks good and here I have to give the semicolon and now we are done so this is the entire logic of the program and now let me show you by running it I will run it for you now so here let me zoom it for you and it says enter the array limit or size let me take it as 5 and as I wrote in the program here it says enter five elements one by one now i will take the elements say 12 36 6 17 and say 8 and now it will ask for the number to be searched here let me take as 17 and press enter and now you can see it says number found search is successful so that means we have been able to find this number 17 which is present in this array. Now let me show you another example where I will search for a number which is not present in the array. So I'll press any key and then I will run it again by pressing the shortcut F9 and here let me zoom it for you and here I will give the enter the array limit of size to be again 5 say and here I will give the elements to be 1, 2, 3, 6 and say 9 and now let me search for a number which is not present in the array let it be say 4 and let me press enter and here you can see it says number not found search is unsuccessful so this is how we perform linear search with the help of C programming so this is the entire program as you can see here as I told you first we take the array then the array size and then we initialize the key value to the number to be searched and then we initialize the flag value to zero and this is the loop variable then we iterate over the loop and if we find that the number is found then we update the value of flag to 1 and then we print number found and if it is not 1 then we update by saying 
number not found so it is unsuccessful so this is the entire logic i hope you understood In today's video, we will be talking about the topic binary search in C programming. So before getting started, I would like to request you people to please like and share our videos with your friends and family and also subscribe to our channel Codus Arcade so that you receive notifications regarding our latest updates. Thank you. So let's get started. So as I told you, our today's topic is binary search in C programming. So for that, let us take an array. So inside the array, let us take the elements one by one. Let me take 10 elements. So the elements are 3, 5, 7, 9, 13, 17, 33, 47, 88 and 95. So before starting this search, I want to mention one very important thing, which is binary search can be performed only in a sorted array. So as you can see in the screen, this is a sorted array. All the elements are arranged in an ascending order. So here you can see that the indexing starts from zero and goes on till nine so here the array size is 10 and let us consider the key value to be 17 which will be the element that we will be searching by performing binary search so we are supposed to find this key value 17 in this given array now the question arises how will we perform this so let me tell you the solution. We will first divide this array by finding the mid value or mid term. The formula to find the mid value is mid equal to start plus end divided by 2. So as you can see in the diagram, the start value is 0 and the end value is 9. So the mid value formula will be 0 plus 9 divided by 2 and it will be 9 by 2 which can be approximately termed as 4. So now we can say that 17 or the key value is greater than A of mid. That means 17 is greater than A of 4 and in the array we can see that 17 is greater than the A of 4 element which is 13. So now what we will do is we will change the formula for start which will be start is equal to mid plus 1 that is the mid value was 4 so it will be 4 plus 1 is equal to 5 and we already have the end value which was 9 so end equal to 9. We are skipping the first 5 elements because the key value 17 is not present there as you can see. So now, again, let us find the mid value in this new array. Mid is equal to start plus end divided by 2. So our new start is 5 and the end value is 9. It will be 5 plus 9 divided by 2 is equal to 14 divided by 2, which is 7. Now let us check once again. 17 is less than A of mid or 17 is less than a of 7 or we can say 17 is less than 47 which is true so now because it is less than the mid value what we will do is we will change the formula for end end equal to mid minus 1 that is 7 minus 1 is equal to 6 so we have start equal to 5 and end equal to 6 and this is our new array. So we are skipping this end part because key value is not present here or it is less than this part. So now again mid is equal to start plus end divided by 2 is equal to 5 plus 6 divided by 2 
is equal to 5 approximately. So now let us check once again. 17 is equal to A of mid. 17 is equal to A of 5 or we can see here that 17 is equal to 17. This means that our search has been successful. So we can print it. If we don't find the element in that case we will print search is unsuccessful. So now this is the entire logic of performing binary search to find an element in an array. And as I told you, binary search can only be performed in a sorted array. So the array has to be sorted first and then we can do the binary search. In my case, I will be taking a already sorted array. And in the next topic, I will show you how to sort arrays with the help of bubble sort and other sorting algorithms. So now let us go on to the editor so that I can show you the program to implement binary search. So here I am going to my editor and let me start by the header file hash include stdio.h which is the standard input output library and then I will start with the int main and inside my main function I will declare my variables which are of the integer data type so I will take the loop variable i then I will take the start variable then I will take the end variable then I will take the mid variable, then the array size n, then I will take the key to be searched and finally I will take the array say of 100 size so that I can sort it for more numbers. And now I will use the printf function. And here I will ask the user to enter the number of elements. And to take the control to the next line, I will use the slash n. And now using the scanf function, I will take the input from the user and store it by using the percent %d and n. So now I have taken the number of elements from the user. Now I will use the printf statement or function to tell the user to enter the elements one by one. So I will use enter percent %d integers 1 by 1 and then here also I will use the slash n so that I can give the control to the next line and after the comma I will give the n value. So now again I have to use a for loop here so that I can take the input from the user i equal to 0 i less than n i plus plus inside the curly braces I will use the scanf function and here I will take the input from the user and store it by using percent %d. A of i. So this is the way how I can store the input from the user. And after that, 
I will go out of this for loop and again I will use the print function and here I will type enter the value to be searched and here also I will use the slash in character and here I will take the user input by scanf percent b and I will store it in the key variable so first I have to initialize the values for start and end so I will take start to be 0 and because the indexing starts from 0 so I have to take end equal to n minus 1 And now I have to write the formula for mid, which is mid equal to start plus end divided by 2. And you have to be very sure about this bracket because otherwise it will give errors or you will not be able to implement it correctly. After that, I will be using a while loop and the condition will be while start is always less than equal to end then here I will write the condition if A of mid is less than my key value then inside the curly braces as I told you in the explanation my start value will be start equal to mid plus one so this is the condition and I have to take another condition which is else if if I find the key then I have to write a of mid equal equal the key value then here I will print percent D found at location percent D. I will tell you what I am trying to do and let me give a full stop and after that let me again use a escape character which is slash in so that I can go on to the next line and after the comma I will use key and then my mid plus one because if I have found the key then I will say key is found at the mid plus one location and after this if I have already found the key then I have to go out of the loop for which I will be using the break statement and now if this condition is also not satisfied if I have not found the key then what I have to do is I have to again compare the other condition which is the last one which is else and inside the brackets I have to write end equal to mid minus 1 
so this is done and finally I have to again update the value of mid which is mid equal to start plus n divided by 2 now comes the condition where I will not be finding the key then this will be a unsuccessful search and for that also I have to use the print function so it will be like if start greater than n then inside curly braces I will use the print function and here I will type not found and then I will use person T isn't present in the list full stop and then I will use the slash n and after the comma here I will take the key variable so this is done and because I have taken int main as you can see here I will use the return 0 statement at last so this is the entire logic and now I will show you by running it so let me run it for you so it says there is an error okay the error is I have only written print so it should be printf now it's correct so let me run it so that I can show you the output so here I am running it for you okay so it's asking me for the number of elements let me take 5 and here I will take the 5 integers 1 2 3 4 5 and now it's asking me to find the value let the value be say 5 so it is in the array as you can see this is the last one so when I press enter now it says 5 found at location 5 so this is working all right now let me show you for the unsuccessful search where I will not be giving the element which is present in the existing array so here let me run it once again and let me take I suppose 6 elements and 1 2 3 4 5 6 and you have to keep in mind that you are always giving sorted array only otherwise it will not work and if I press enter now and it's asking me for the value to find let me take 9 and press enter so here you can see let me zoom it for you it says not found 9 isn't present in the list so this is the logic behind this guys So here is the entire program. I hope you have understood. This is how we can perform binary search in C programming. In this video, we will learn about sorting algorithms in arrays in C programming. We will be sorting the array elements and for that we will be using the selection sort algorithm. Before starting the video, I would like to request you people to please like and share our videos with your friends and family and subscribe to our channel Coders Arcade so that you receive notifications about our latest updates. Thank you. So let's get started. First of all, we will try to understand about the logic associated with selection short, how to use it in our program and then we will write a practical program and understand its execution. So let's start. Let us look at an example. Consider an array of 5 elements. 
the elements are 5, 3, 8, 2, 1. Then their index numbers will be 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4. In selection short, one by one indexes are selected and the smallest among all the elements is placed or shifted to that particular index. In this way, the index number goes on increasing till the last index and finally we get our sorted array. In this example, we can see that we have 5 elements and their indexing is from 0 to 4. At index 0, the element is 5, so it will be selected and then the smallest element in the array will be chosen. As we can see, the smallest element in this array is 1. Now, these two elements will be swapped and 5 will go to 1's place and 1 will go to 5's place. Now, we will have a new array. At index 0, we have 1. Then, 3, 8, 2 and at index 4, we will have 5. Now, the index will change from 0 to 1 and we have 3 at index 1. Again, the smallest element will be selected and interchanged with the number or the element 3. Here, 2 is the smallest element, so 2 and 3 will interchange their positions. Now, the new array will look somewhat like this. 1, 2, 8, 3 and 5. Now, the index number 2 will be selected and here we have the number 8. Again, the smallest number will be selected, which is 3 in this case, and the numbers will interchange positions. Now, the new array will look like this. 1, 2, 3, 8 and 5. Similarly, after the next pass or iteration, the array will look like this. 1, 2, 3, 5 and 8. So finally, we have our sorted list. This is the basic principle on how selection sort works. One by one, the indexes are selected and the smallest among all the elements is placed or shifted to that particular index. In this way, the index number goes on increasing till the last index and finally we get our sorted array. Now, let's look at one more logic here. In the array, the index numbers are from 0 to 4 and in the selection short algorithm, it's selecting till index 3. So, it is selecting the index which is 1 less than the highest index. It's because on selection of the second last index, we already have the sorted array. So, you need to remember this step because it will help you in the implementation of the for loop in writing the C program. Now, let us go to our IDE so that we can implement this example on selection short by writing a C program. So, as you can see here, I am inside my editor. So, I will start by including the header file. Then I will start with my main function. Here I will start declaring my variables. First I will take the loop variables i and j. Then I will take the size of the array to be size. Then I will take a temp variable for swapping. Then I will take one more variable index so that I can store the index in that and then I will take one variable the minimum one and finally I will take my array of size say 10. Now I will use the print statement so that I can take input from the user. So I will ask the user to enter the size of the array. Here I will use the scanf function so that I can read the size from the user. Now I will use another printf function so that I can tell the user to enter the elements one by one according to the size. So I will use printf and here I will type enter person d elements one by one and I will be giving the slash and escapes character so that it goes to the next line and here I will use a for loop so that I can take input from the user of all the elements in the array. 
for i equal to 0, i less than size, i plus plus and here I will use the scanf function to read the user input. percent d comma and I will save it to the array by using the address operator. So this part is done. Now I will again use one print statement so that I can print the unsorted array. And again I will use a for loop so that I can display the unsorted array i equal to 0, i less than size, i plus plus and I will use the printf function so that I can print the unsorted array percent d, oh I have to give the quote also, percent d and so that I can give a particular distance between the elements, I will use the slash t, which is the tab character. And then I will use my a array by declaring it and calling it a of i. So this is done. With this, we can take a input of the size from the user and we can also print the unsorted array. Let us check it. Before that, I will just use one more thing, return 0 because this will be returning integer values. So let us uh, run it and check if it is correct or not. I'm running it. Okay, it is asking me for the size of the array. Let the size be 5 as we saw in the example. I'll press enter. Okay, it's printing some junk values you can see here. 1733 something. Uh, let me check what is the error. First of all, let me just close it. Okay, uh, I can see that I have used percent D, but I have not given the variable name. So here I will give a comma and give size as the variable. So now let us check it once again. Okay, I will zoom it and let the array size be 5. Yes, now it's correct. Enter five elements one by one. So let us take the elements to be 5, 8, 3, 2 and finally 1 and press enter. Okay, now you can see the unsorted array is 5, 8, 3, 2, 1. So it's working till now. Let us go on with the logic of the program now. So up to this print statement, let us start with the logic now. So I will have to take two for loops, one to select the index and one for comparing the values of the initial index and the index after that. So for that I will be taking the for loops as for i equal to 0, i less than and as I told during the selection shot the index less than the highest index is selected and we get our sorted array so it should be size minus 1. So you need to be careful about this and up to that I will give the increment i++. plus plus. So here this is the outer for loop. Inside that I will take my minimum value to be equal to a of i and I will take the index to be i. Then we can go on and write the next inner for loop for j equal to 0 and here I need to tell you something because this outer loop will actually be for the iteration of the indexes and we need to check from the first index to the next index. So for that we have to go to the next index. How we can do it is we have to write not j equal to 0, we have to go from j equal to i plus 1. Then our condition here will be j should be less than the size so that we can go on till the last index. And finally, it will be 
j plus plus so this is how we go into the inner for loop and here i have to use the conditional if statement where i will be checking the value of the next index with the minimum value so for that what i will write is if a of j is less than min or the minimum value then inside the if statement what we will do is if it is less than the minimum value then we will change the value of minimum so we can do it by writing min equal to a of j and finally we shall also have to change the index here index is i so now the index will become index is equal to j and now we will go out of this if statement and also we will go out of this inner for loop and then when we have found the minimum number we have to swap it or interchange it with the first number or the number at that particular place so for that we need to write a statement like this so as i have declared the temp variable already so we will write temp is equal to a of i then we will write a of i is equal to a of index so that we can change it and finally we will be interchanging this so it will be a of index is equal to temp so this is a basic swapping algorithm i hope you all understand this so with this we have come to the end of the logic in this program and finally what i will do is i will go out of this outer for loop and here i will use the print statement and i will print the sorted array so for that i will use the slash n first and then i will write the sorted array after selection short is again slash n slash n and finally for this also we have to use a for loop for i equal to 0 i less than size i plus plus and inside this we will be printing our sorted array so again i will be using the printf function and inside this i will print percent d and to give a space between the elements i will use the slash t comma and i will call the a of i so that i can get all the elements in my array so with this i am done and this is the entire program so let me now run this so that we can see if it is working properly or not so i will be running it so let me zoom it for you and here it's asking me for the size of the array let it be 5 and yeah it's asking me for the elements 5 elements one by one so i'll give 5 8 3 2 1 and press enter so you can see the unsorted array is 5 8 3 2 1 and after the selection sort is done it says the sorted array after selection sort is 1, 2, 3, 5, and 8. So our program is working perfectly. So this is how you perform the selection short algorithm. In this video, we will learn about one of the sorting algorithms in arrays in C programming. We will be sorting the array elements and for that we will be using the bubble sort algorithm. Before starting the video, I would like to request you people to please like and share our videos and subscribe to our channel Codus Arcade and press the bell icon so that you receive notifications about our latest updates. Thank you. So let's get started. First of all, we will try to understand about the logic associated with bubble sort, how to use it in our program and then we will write a practical program and understand its implementation and execution. So let's get started. Let us 
Look at an example. Consider an array of 5 elements. The elements are 13, 24, 36, 17 and 12. Then their index numbers will be 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4. We will be arranging this array in ascending order. So the final result after bubble sort will be the following array. 12, 13, 17, 24 and 36. Bubble sort is the simplest sorting algorithm that works by repeatedly swapping the adjacent elements if they are in wrong order. This swapping is done by comparison. In this example, we can see that we have 5 elements and their indexing is from 0 to 4. In the first iteration, at index 0, the first element is 13. So it will be compared to the next element which is 24 and then the greater element between the two will go towards the right if necessary. But we can see that 13 is smaller than 24. Therefore, no swapping will happen. Then 24 and 36 will be compared and as 24 is smaller than 36, it will remain in its same place. Then 36 will be compared to 17 and since it is greater than 17, they will interchange positions. Then 36 and 12 will be compared and since 36 is greater than 12, they will again interchange positions. Thus, after the first iteration, 36 has reached its desired position and the array will look like this. 13, 24, 17, 12 and 36. Now, in the second iteration, 13 will be compared to 24. Since 13 is less than 24, they will stay at their original positions. Now, 24 will be compared to 17. Since 24 is greater than 17, they will swap positions. Now, 24 will be compared to 12. Again, as 24 is greater than 12, they will interchange positions. Then, 24 will be compared to 36. And as 24 is less than 36, both of them will remain in their original positions. So, after the second iteration, the array looks like this. 13, 17, 12, 24 and 36. In the third iteration, 13 will be compared to 17. They will remain in their original positions since 13 is less than 17. Then 17 and 12 will be compared and they will interchange positions as 17 is greater than 12. Then 17 will be compared to 24 and they both will remain in their original positions because 17 is less than 24 and 24 and 36 will also remain in their same positions because of the same condition. So after third iteration, the array will look like this 13, 12, 17, 24 and 36. In the fourth iteration, 13 will be compared with 12 and since it's greater than 12, both the elements will swap positions. In this way, after each iteration, the greatest element in the array gets bubbled up to its desired position. Therefore, this algorithm is known as the bubble sort algorithm. Thus, you can see that after the fourth iteration, we have got our sorted array, which is 12, 13, 17, 24 and 36. This is how the bubble sort algorithm works. Now let us go to our IDE so that we can implement this example on bubble sort by writing a C program. So as you can see we are inside our IDE and let's start writing the program. I will start by including the header file and then I will start with the main function. Here let me start declaring the variables. First I will declare my array. Let the array be A and the size be 10. Then I will take a variable to store the size. Let it be N. And then I will declare a variable temp so that I can swap the variables. And then I will take my loop variables. So let it be I, J, K and L. And finally the semicolon. Here. First of all, I will use a print function so that I can tell the user to enter the size of the array and the slash and character. 
so that the control goes to the next line and I will use the scanf function now so that I can store the size of the array into a variable so it will be person d comma and and the variable will be n then again I will use the printf function so that I can tell the user to enter the elements one by one enter person d elements one by one and then again the slash n so that I can go to the next line and finally here I have to give the variable name which is n and here to read the input from the user I have to use a for loop so for i equal to 0 i less than n i plus plus and inside the for loop I will use the scanf function so that I can read the input from the user and store it into my array a so it will be person d address operator a of i so with this i can store the array then here i will print the unsorted array with the help of the printf function so printf the unsorted array is here i will use two slash ends so that i can give a considerable gap and this quote should also be outside and for displaying the unsorted array i have to again use the for loop so it will be say for j equal to 0 my other loop variable j less than n j plus plus and inside the for loop i will use the printf function so that i can display the unsorted array so percent d and to give a precise gap between the elements in the array i will use the slash t or the tab character and here again i have to call my array by a of j so with this we can take the user input for the size of the array then we can tell the user to enter the elements one by one and then we can display the unsorted array now let us try to run this program and check whether the program is working till now or not before that uh, let me use the return statement because this function will be returning integer values so now it's correct let me run it okay so now let the size be 5 and yes it's asking me for the 5 elements one by one I will give 13, 24, 36, 17 and 12. So you can see that the unsorted array has been printed on the command prompt console. 13, 24, 36, 17 and 12. So our program is working correctly as of now. So let us go on and write the logic of the program. So first of all, let us write the swapping algorithm so for that i will use a for loop and i have two variables as you can see k and l as you can see here so i will take for k is equal to 0 k less than here i want to tell you something very important we saw that when we have five elements in our array in the fourth iteration we get our sorted array so that means the looping or the iteration should be one number less than the highest element. So in that case, it should be n minus one. So here the value of k should be going on till k equal to zero to k less than n minus one. Because in n minus one iterations, we get our sorted array. So you need to remember this logic. Otherwise you will be encountering errors in your program then i will use the increment and inside this i will do the swapping algorithm for that 
first of all i have to use the if statement so if a of k is greater than a of k plus 1 which will be the next element in that case i will do the swapping so inside the if statement as i have declared the temp variable what i will do is temp is equal to a of k then a of k is equal to a of k plus 1 and finally a of k plus 1 is equal to temp so this is a basic swapping algorithm i hope you guys know about this and i think i made a mistake here so this will be a semicolon and then with this we are done with the swapping algorithm but this will be for the comparison of the numbers or the elements but we also have to give a outer for loop for the number of iterations so for this i will use another for loop which is for l equal to 0 and as i showed you the number of iterations will be n minus 1 so l less than n minus 1 l plus plus and then we will start this for loop and this brace will not be here it will be after the end of the inner for loop so for that this is the inner for loop so after this we will be using the outer for loop so now this is done then finally as we have printed the unsorted array we will also be printing the sorted array so for that here I will again use the printf function and I will type the sorted array after bubble sort is and here so that I can give the control to the next line what I will do is I will use a slash n and here also I will use two slash n's so this is done and to display the array I have to use a for loop so for i equal to 0, i less than n, i plus plus and here I will print percent %t and to give a space between the elements I will give the slash t or the tab character and finally I will call my variable which is a of i. So with this we are done with the logic so let us run the program and check whether it is working or not so i'm running it and okay it's asking me for the size of the array let the size be 5 and let us take the earlier example only 13 24 36 17 and 12. so you can see the unsorted array is 13, 24, 36, 17 and 12 and after the bubble sort is done, it displays the sorted array after bubble sort is 12, 13, 17, 24 and 36. So this is it, our program is working properly. So this is how you can use the bubble sort algorithm and sort an array in ascending order. We will be learning about a new topic which is introduction to functions in C programming. Before starting the video, I would like to request you people to please like our videos and share it with your friends and family. And also subscribe to our channel Codus Arcade so that you receive notifications about our latest updates and you do not miss out on our future uploads. Thank you. So let's get started. As I said, Today's topic is introduction to functions in C programming. What are actually functions? Let us see the definition of a function. A function is actually a group of statements that performs a specific task. In other words, you can also say that a function is a set of statements that takes input, performs some computation and produces the output. Functions in C programming can be categorized into two types. They are the built-in functions 
or the library functions and the second type is the user defined functions. Let us first see the built in functions or the library functions. So the built in functions or the library functions are provided by the C compiler itself and they perform standard and predefined tasks. For example, we have the print function or the printf, the scan function or the scanf to read input from the user and we also have other functions like power, square root, etc. These are called the built-in functions or library functions because they are inbuilt in the C compiler and they are designed to perform standard and predefined tasks. Now let us move on to the user defined functions. So what are user defined functions? As the name suggests, user defined functions are written by the user. C language allows users or programmers like us to create our own functions. These functions can be defined by us or the users or programmers in order to perform specific tasks according to our own requirements. Therefore, these functions are called user defined functions because we have the control over them and we can define and make them work according to our own requirements. The characteristics of user defined functions are these functions are written by the user and these functions help to perform customized tasks. Now, C programs can be written in two different ways. The two ways are the first one is unstructured programming or you can say that in unstructured programming we do not use user defined functions and the second type is structured programming where we make the use of user defined functions. All the programs that we have learned till now we have been using the unstructured mode of programming where what happens is the entire program is written within the single function which is also known as the main function. From now on we will be using structured programming and we will be writing our own functions. So these functions will be the user defined functions and these come under the structured programming category. Now let me give you an example of unstructured programming where we do not use user defined functions. So here is an example. You can see this program is for the subtraction of two numbers. As you can see, all the logic of the program is written within the main function. And here we have taken two variables a and b and then we have calculated the difference. And finally, we are printing the difference. So when we run this program and execute it, we get the output as follows. The output will be difference is 10. Now this is an example of unstructured programming without user defined functions. Let us move on to the next type which is structured programming where user defined functions are actually used. So here in the screen you can see this is the example of a structured programming. In this you can see the difference. The main function comes afterwards but before that we have to declare the user defined function as you can see here. The name of the function is diff and it takes two variables a and b. This can be called the parameters. We will come into these things in our later sections. But for now, you just need to remember that in case of user defined functions, we have to follow it step by step. As you can see here, first we have to declare the function. Then we have to define the function. And then in the main function, we are calling the user defined function. So there are three parts, function declaration, function definition and the function call. This is also a program for the subtraction of two numbers and when we execute this, we get the output as follows. So when we run it, we get the output, the difference is 10. So these were the two examples of unstructured programming and structured programming where we use user defined or we don't use user defined functions. I hope you have understood the difference between structured and unstructured programming. Okay then, see you in our next video. Thank you. 
in today's section we will be learning about a new topic which is the elements of user defined functions before starting the video i would like to request you people to please like and share our videos if you like them and also subscribe to our channel coders arcade and press the bell icon so that you receive notifications regarding our latest updates and you do not miss out on our future video uploads thank you so let's get started as i said today's topic is elements of user defined functions so in the previous section i have already told you about functions structured programming unstructured programming in this section let us start with the elements of user defined functions how to declare the function how to define the function and how to call the function so let us start with all the elements of the user defined functions so the first element of user defined functions is the function declaration the second element is the function definition and the third element is the function call let us look at them one by one the first one is function declaration or it is also known as function prototype it means that the function actually needs to be declared before calling that function without the function declaration we cannot call the function so the function declaration part it actually consists of four parts the four parts are return type function name parameter list with the data types and finally the terminating semicolon let us look at the syntax of the function declaration the syntax is return type then followed by the function name and inside the parenthesis we have the parameter list with the data type and finally followed by the semicolon for example int subtract in the parenthesis we have the parameters int a comma int b it can be more or it can be less also now let us move on to the second element which is the function definition function definition is the actual code for the function with the help of which we can perform the specific task so what is the need of the function definition let us look at that the need of the function definition is that it provides the actual body of the function without the function definition the function won't work so we have to provide the definition of the function it is actually the body of the function it contains the entire logic the second one is it contains executable code that means it has certain executable statements with the help of which we can define the function or how to perform that specific task so here in the function definition the first line is called the function header the next very important point to remember here is that the function header should be identical to function prototype but it should be without any semicolon so you have to remember this point the next point or the final point in function definition is arguments or parameters the names that are provided to them have to be specified here with its data type in the function definition so this was about the function definition now let us see a simple example so that i can explain more about the function definition with the syntax and example so the syntax is as i told earlier return type followed by the function name and then inside the parenthesis we will have the parameter list with data type and inside the curly braces we will be having the local variable declaration and then we will be having the statements like statement 1 statement 2 and it will go on till n number of statements and finally we will have the return statement because the function will return a value right that's why we will have the return statement so that we can return the task or the value or the work that it is performing to our other functions or maybe the calling function so as you know the syntax let us move on to one example so as you can see in the screen int diff and then in the parenthesis we will have let's say two variables so that i can do the subtraction between the two so int of a and int of b these are of the integer data type so these are the parameter lists including the data type the data type here is int and inside the curly braces i have int diff 
then diff is equal to a minus b and then finally we will be returning the difference so return difference d i double f the variable name can be anything as i already told you it depends on the wish of every user it will vary from person to person so this is an example of how to define a function simple example we have taken so that i can show you the subtraction of two variables a and b now let us once again recall all the parts of the function definition so as you can see in the screen this is int difference and inside the parenthesis we have int a comma int b and then int diff so diff here is the local declaration so we are declaring a variable which is of the integer data type in order to store the difference of the two variables so now let us write the exact logic or the formula for the difference so diff is equal to a minus b and you should always remember that every statement should end with a semicolon and finally we will return the difference or the value so return diff you can provide a parenthesis or you may not provide a parenthesis it's up to you but you have to end it with a semicolon so now this diff equal to a minus b will be the statement there can be n number of statements depending on our requirement and this return diff is the return statement and as you can see inside the int diff parenthesis these are the parameter list and these are also known as the formal parameters which are a and b now the diff which has been written here is actually the name of the function that's why it is function name and the int here is actually as the type returned by this function the return type in our case is integer it can be float or any other it can be character also so this is all about the parts in function definition i hope you understood now let us move on to the third element which is function call so only by defining a function is not enough to perform the task in order to use the function it needs to be called so that's why function call is necessary a function can be called by specifying its function name followed by a list of parameters enclosed in parentheses and separated by commas as i showed in the earlier section so you have to write the name of the function followed by parentheses in this way you can call the function the syntax is function name in the bracket parameter list for example diff a comma b followed by the semicolon so this is how you can call a function difference or diff which we have defined earlier so this is a function call diff is the function name and a and b are the parameters so in the earlier sections you have already seen some examples using functions so i just wanted to give you a summary of the elements of user defined functions so what did we learn today we learned about the three elements of user defined functions those were function declaration function definition and the function call so i hope you have understood thanks for watching see you in our next video happy learning in this section we will be learning more about functions and about unstructured programming and structured programming their differences and the advantages of using structured programming over unstructured programming and also we will be looking at some examples of how to write programs using unstructured and structured programming before starting the video i would like to request you people to please like our videos and share it with your friends and family and also subscribe to our channel codes arcade so that you receive notifications about our latest updates and also you do not miss out on our future uploads thank you so let's get started so as i told in my earlier section c programs can be written in two ways the two ways are 
unstructured programming or you can say which do not use user defined functions or the second one is structured programming which can be said they use user defined functions all the programs that we have been writing till now we have been using the unstructured mode of programming where the entire logic of the program is written within one function which is called the main function as i told you earlier so from now on we will be using the structured mode of programming because it has various advantages over the unstructured mode of programming so as i told in the earlier section here are the examples for unstructured programming and structured programming let us look at those once again so as you can see on the screen this is the example for unstructured programming where we had a program for subtraction of two numbers and you can see here inside the main function only we wrote the entire logic so we had two variables a and b of the integer data type then we calculated the difference and then printed the result then finally when we execute this we get the output as the difference is 10 now this was the unstructured programming mode let us see the example of the structured programming mode in the structured programming mode the example was like this as you can see on the screen here first we have to declare the user defined function then we have to define the user defined function and finally in the main function we are giving the function call as is displayed in the example in this case also when we run this we get the output which is the difference is 10 now as you have seen the two examples let us move on to the next section which is the disadvantages of unstructured programming so let us discuss all the disadvantages of unstructured programming one by one the first disadvantage is in unstructured programming the program is very difficult to read and understand the second disadvantage is it is very difficult to debug and identify errors in case of unstructured programming the next one is programmers find it very difficult to test the program the fourth one is in case of unstructured programming it is very difficult to modify the program and the final disadvantage of using unstructured programming is that it is very difficult to reuse the logic in case of the unstructured programming so as you can see here we have so many disadvantages of using the unstructured mode of programming that's why we should always try to use the structured mode of programming now let us move on to the next section where we will be looking at the advantages of using the structured programming or the user defined functions the first advantage is when we use the user defined functions programming becomes very easy the second one is with the help of user defined functions the large and complex tasks can be broken down into smaller simple tasks using several functions the third one is the debugging process becomes very easy and it is very easy to find and remove errors the fourth advantage of using user defined functions is that the readability of the program is increased to a greater extent then the most important advantage of using structured programming or user defined functions is that it increases the reusability it means that once the function body or definition has been written the function can be called from many different places in a program and it can be used multiple number of times so this is the best advantage of using user defined functions or structured programming in this case it increases the reusability we can reuse the logic of the code again and again now that you know the advantages of using user defined functions and also the disadvantages of using unstructured programming let us move on to our editor so that i can show you two examples where we will use unstructured programming as well as structured programming with the help of user defined functions so let's quickly move on to our editor. 
So here you can see I am inside my editor and let's start with an example of unstructured programming. So I will start with my header file. Then here, as I am using the unstructured mode of programming, what I will do is, I will use my main function, void main, and inside my main function, I will write the entire logic of the program. So let me take the variables, int a is equal to 20, comma, b is equal to 10, and the third variable to be difference so that I can store the result of the subtraction in this variable. Now let me define the difference variable is equal to a minus b. Now this is a simple example so I will just be printing the result or the difference. The difference is Person D so that I can read the variable and here I will call my difference variable with the semicolon. So this is as simple as that. This thing is done. So I will be running this so that I can show you the output. So here I am running it and you can see, let me zoom it, the difference is 10. So this is the basic example of unstructured mode of programming. Now let us write the same program using structured mode of programming. So let me delete this lines of code. And again, I will start in this case with the user defined function. So I will take the return type, which is the int and then I will write the name of the user defined function followed by brackets and inside this I have to give the parameters say int a comma int b and inside the curly brackets or inside this function I have to define the logic so let me take the variable to be diff and then here I will calculate diff equal to a minus b and finally I will return the diff value. So this is the logic of this program and here you can see let me just comment this out so that you can understand this is the function declaration and here this can be called the function definition and after that here I will have my main function so void main and inside curly braces inside the main function I will be taking my variables int a is equal to 20 then b is equal to 10 so that I get a positive result and then finally I will be taking the difference variable and here I will use my difference variable and from here I will call my user defined function so that I can get the result. So to call this, I have to use the name of my user defined function, which is difference. And inside the parenthesis, I have to give the variables. So it will be a comma b. Now I will simply print the result. So print the difference 
is percent b and my diff variable semicolon so it's done and here this line is actually the function call so let me just write it down here so that you can understand better So this is the function call. Now let me run this so that I can show you the same output. I am running it. So here you can see we are getting the exact output but with a different mode of programming. This is structured programming with the help of user defined functions. The answer is the difference is 10. So I hope you guys have understood both the methods of writing unstructured as well as structured programming by using user defined functions or by not using user defined functions. So this is all about this video guys. Thanks for watching. If you have any doubts, you can ask them in the comment section. I will be glad to clarify all your doubts. In the next section, we will be learning about elements of function and how to define functions, the syntax of functions and all these things. This was just a example to show you the different approach of structured and unstructured programming. Thank you for watching. See you guys in our next video. In this section, we are going to learn about a very important topic in C language, which is recursion. Before starting the video, I would like to request you people to please like and share our videos with your friends and family and at the same time subscribe to our channel Codis Arcade and press the bell icon if you like our videos. Thank you. So let's get started. Today's topic is recursion. So let us move on to the definition of recursion. Recursion means a function calling itself is called a recursive function or recursion. In simple words, Calling a function from the definition of the same function is called recursion or a recursive function. For example, we have the main function. Then inside the main function, I will use the first print statement where I will write start. Now I want to call the main function explicitly. For the first time, the main function is called by the operating system or the OS. Second time, I will be calling it. So, you can see here, inside the main function, after the first print statement, where I have written start, I am calling my main function explicitly. Next, I am going to add one more statement. So, after the main function call, again I am going to write my third statement, which is print end. So, this is a basic example. Here you can see that we have two print statements, which print the messages start and end. And in between, we have explicitly called the main function. Now let's see how it gets executed. In general, to execute functions in the application inside the RAM, a memory will be allocated. This memory is called the stack memory. I am not talking only about C language. In any programming language, stack memory is common and any function or any block of code is always executed inside the stack memory. In order to execute a method or a block of code, some amount of memory will be allocated inside the stack memory. This particular amount of memory is called frame. So for the first time, when we are executing this program, operating system invokes the main method. So some memory will be allocated to this main method. Here, one main frame will be created and a certain amount of memory will be allocated in order to execute all the three statements defined inside the main method. First, it will print the start message. In the second statement, we are calling the main method explicitly. Therefore, in order to execute this main method, one more frame will be created. Now, inside this main frame, all the three statements should be executed. So let's start again. The first statement is print start. Again, in the second statement, the main method is called explicitly. So, another main frame will be created. Similarly, here also the same process will continue. It will print start 
again we are calling the main method explicitly. So again one more main frame will be created. If you observe carefully, every time this program is moving in the forward direction only. Once all the three statements have been executed, then the frame will be deleted and the memory will be assigned or allocated to some other method execution. But in this case or in this example, every time the control is moving in the forward direction only. So there is no chance for the control to come back and complete the execution of the previous frame. Therefore, there will come a time when the memory will be full and the program execution will encounter an error called the runtime error and it will be showing out of memory. So our program will terminate abnormally because there is not enough memory in the stack to continue and to complete this program execution process. Therefore, the most important thing that we should keep in mind while working with recursions is that we should be careful while writing the logic of the program because the order in which the control is going forward, it should similarly come back and end the process where the execution process started. Therefore, we should follow that format while writing the logic of the programs for recursions. The best example to explain recursive functions is factorial of a number using recursion. Let us go to the editor so that I can show you how to write a C program to calculate factorial of a given number using recursion. After the execution, we will come back and see how the program execution occurs. So let's quickly move on to our editor. As you can see here, I am inside my editor screen, which is code blocks. So let me start by including the header file. And here I will take my main function of the integer data type. And inside the main function, I will start by writing the logic. So first I will take a variable n for the count and then I will take another variable to store the result. Now I will use the print statement so that I can ask the user the value of n. Then I will use the scanf function to read the input from the user. So it will be percent %d address of the variable n. So this thing is done. Here I will take the result variable and I will call the factorial method which I have to define outside of the main function. Factorial of n. So this is also done. After that we will be printing the result. The factorial of person d is person d comma then for the first person d it will be the variable n and for the second person d it will be the results variable. So this is also done and just because it is and and just because this function is returning integer values I have to give return 0. So now this thing is done. Now let us go on to the function definition. So here it will be the same thing integer data type then it will be factorial as I have written here as you can see here factorial so it should match factorial and then I have to take the variable which is integer and it int n. The variable can be same no matter what it doesn't clash it's upon your wish no problem. So now let us go on to the definition of the function. So here it will be int result and now the first condition is in factorials we know that the factorial of 0 is 1. So we will use the if statement n equal equal 0 then the result will be is equal to 1. Now we will go on to the else block if the value of n is not equal to 0. Then we will start the else block. So inside the else block, 
we will use the actual formula for the factorial of a number. So the formula is result is equal to n into factorial n minus 1. And after that, the final thing that we have to do is we have to return the result. So with this, the logic of the program is complete. Now, the question is that why is this called a recursive function? As I told, the definition of recursion is that a function calling itself is called a recursion or a recursive function. Therefore, as you can see here, inside the function definition of factorial, I am again calling my factorial method. So, inside the same definition of factorial, I am calling my factorial function or method. Therefore, this is called a recursion. So, I hope you have understood this. Now, let us look at the execution process, how this factorial will actually execute itself. Let's see that. So, now let's see how the method spaces are created, how the control will go in a forward direction and how it will again come back. So, first the memory will be allocated to main frame. So, the starting frame will be the main frame. We are declaring the end value and we are declaring one more variable result and then we are reading the value of n. In the next step, we are calling the factorial method. Suppose, let us take the value of n to be equal to 4. So, it will be factorial of 4. The result will not be assigned. First, factorial of 4 method has to get completed and executed. So, method space will be allocated to factorial of n value 4. Then the factorial method execution will start. First, if n equal equal 0 or 4 equal equal 0, as you can see condition is false. So, the if block will not execute, control goes to the else block. In the else block, n into factorial of n minus 1 executes. So, 4 into factorial of n minus 1, that is 3. Now, to multiply this expression, first we have to know the value of factorial 3. So, one new method space will be created for factorial n equal to 3. Here, if 3 equal equal 0, and we see that the condition is false, so in this case also, if block, if block will not execute, control goes to the else block. In the else block, it is 3 into factorial of n minus 1, that is 2. Again, we should find what is the value of factorial 2. So, one new method space will be created for factorial n equal to 2. Now, if 2 equal equal 0, here also the condition is false. So, the if block will not execute. Control goes to the else block. In the else block, it is 2 into factorial of 1. Again, we have to find what is the value of factorial 1. So, one new method space will be created for factorial n equal to 1. Now, if 1 equal equal 0, here also the condition is false. So, if block will not execute, control goes to the else block. In the else block, it is 1 into factorial of 0. Now, one last method space will be created for factorial n equal to 0. Now, you have to observe carefully. If 0 equal equal 0, here the condition is true. Now, else block will not execute. In all the previous method spaces, we have seen that the else block was executed and the if block was terminated. But in this case, if block will execute and the else block will be terminated. So, in the if block, result equal to 1. That means, in the result variable, the value 1 will be stored. After the if else statement, what is the next statement? Here, we are returning the result. So, return 1, which is the value of result. The value of result here is 1. So, the value 1 will return back here as you can see on the screen, because the factorial 0 function started executing from this position. So, result of the factorial 0 function will return back to the same place. So, 1 into 1, therefore result equal to 1. So, again this result will return back here. So, 2 into 1 and now result equal to 2. So, again this result value will return back 
here as you can see on the screen. So now 3 into 2 that is result is equal to 6. So again this result will return back here. So 4 into 6. Now the result value is equal to 24 as you can see here. So this result will be finally stored into main method result variable. So result equal to 24. And now we are printing this result which is 24. This value 24 is actually the factorial of 4. So this is the end of the program execution. Now let us move on to our editor again so that I can show you the output of the program that you wrote earlier. So here as you can see I am inside my editor again. So this was the program that we wrote earlier. Now let me run it so that I can show you the output. I am running it. And let me just zoom it for you. So here let me take the value which we saw earlier. Let me take 4 and press enter. And you can see the factorial of 4 is 24. So we are getting the correct output. So let me press any key. So guys, this is the entire logic of the recursion topic, which is a very conceptual topic in functions. And the best example to learn about recursions is factorial. There are many more examples, but this is the best example with the help of which you can learn about recursions. So that's why I took this example to find out the factorial of a given number. I hope you like the video. If you have any doubts, you can post them in the comment section. I will be very happy to clarify those doubts. Thank you and happy learning. See you guys in the next video. Thank you. In this section, we will be learning about a logical concept in C programming, which is how to find the factorial of a given number using C programming. Before starting the video, I would like to request you people to please like and share our videos with your friends and family and also subscribe to our channel Codus Arcade and press the bell icon so that you receive notifications regarding our latest updates and you do not miss out on our future uploads. Thank you. So let's get started. As I said, today's topic is finding the factorial of a given number using C program. Let us go to the editor so that I can show you how to write a C program to calculate factorial of a given number using recursion. After the execution, we will come back and see how the program execution occurs. So let's quickly move on to our editor. As you can see here, I am inside my editor screen which is code blocks. So let me start by including the header file. And here I will take my main function of the integer data type. And inside the main function, I will start by writing the logic. So first I will take a variable n for the count and then I will take another variable to store the result. Now I will use the print statement so that I can ask the user the value of n. Then I will use the scanf function to read the input from the user. So it will be percent %d address of the variable n. So this thing is done. Here I will take the result variable and I will call the factorial method which I have to define outside of the main function. Factorial of n. So this is also done. After that we will be printing the result. The factorial of person d is person d comma then for the first person d it will be the variable n and for the second person d it will be the results variable so this is also done and just because it is and and just because this function is returning integer values i have to give return 0 so now this thing is done. Now let us go on to the function definition. So
so here it will be the same thing integer data type then it will be factorial as i have written here as you can see here factorial so it should match factorial and then i have to take the variable which is integer and it int n the variable can be same no matter what it doesn't clash it's upon your wish no problem so now let us go on to the definition of the function so here it will be int result and now the first condition is in factorials we know that the factorial of 0 is 1 so we will use the if statement n equal equal 0 then the result will be is equal to 1 now we will go on to the else block if the value of n is not equal to 0 then we will start the else block so inside the else block we will use the actual formula for the factorial of a number so the formula is result is equal to n into factorial n minus 1 and after that the final thing that we have to do is we have to return the result so with this the logic of the program is complete now the question is that why is this called a recursive function as i told the definition of recursion is that a function calling itself is called a recursion or a recursive function therefore as you can see here inside the function definition of factorial i am again calling my factorial method so inside the same definition of factorial i am calling my factorial function or method therefore this is called a recursion so i hope you have understood this now let us look at the execution process how this factorial will actually execute itself let's see that so now let's see how the method spaces are created how the control will go in a forward direction and how it will again come back so first the memory will be allocated to mainframe so the starting frame will be the mainframe we are declaring the n value and we are declaring one more variable result and then we are reading the value of n in the next step we are calling the factorial method suppose let us take the value of n to be equal to 4 so it will be factorial of 4 the result will not be assigned first factorial of 4 method has to get completed and executed so method space will be allocated to factorial of n value 4 then the factorial method execution will start first if n equal equal 0 or 4 equal equal 0 as you can see condition is false so the if block will not execute control goes to the else block in the else block n into factorial of n minus 1 executes so 4 into factorial of n minus 1 that is 3 now to multiply this expression first we have to know the value of factorial 3 so one new method space will be created for factorial n equal to 3 here if 3 equal equal 0 and we see that the condition is false so in this case also if block if block will not execute control goes to the else block in the else block it is 3 into factorial of n minus 1 that is 2 again we should find what is the value of factorial 2 so one new method space will be created for factorial n equal to 2 now if 2 equal equal 0 here also the condition is false so the if block will not execute control goes to the else block in the else block it is 2 into factorial of 1 again we have to find what is the value of factorial 1 so one new method space will be created for factorial n equal to 1 now if 1 equal equal 0 here also the condition is false so if block will not execute control goes to the else block in the else block it is 1 into factorial of 0 
Now one last method space will be created for factorial n equal to 0. Now you have to observe carefully. If 0 equal equal 0, here the condition is true. Now else block will not execute. In all the previous method spaces, we have seen that the else block was executed and the if block was terminated. But in this case, if block will execute and the else block will be terminated. So in the if block, result equal to 1. That means in the result variable, the value 1 will be stored. After the if else statement, what is the next statement? Here we are returning the result. So return 1, which is the value of result. The value of result here is 1. So the value 1 will return back here as you can see on the screen because the factorial 0 function started executing from this position. So result of the factorial 0 function will return back to the same place. So 1 into 1, therefore result equal to 1. So again this result will return back here. So 2 into 1 and now result equal to 2. So again this result value will return back here as you can see on the screen. So now 3 into 2 that is result is equal to 6. So again this result will return back here. So 4 into 6. Now the result value is equal to 24 as you can see here. So this result will be finally stored into main method result variable. So result equal to 24. And now we are printing this result which is 24. This value 24 is actually the factorial of 4. So this is the end of the program execution. Now let us move on to our editor again so that I can show you the output of the program that you wrote earlier. So here as you can see I am inside my editor again. So this was the program that we wrote earlier. Now let me run it so that I can show you the output. I am running it. And let me just zoom it for you. So here let me take the value which we saw earlier. Let me take 4 and press enter. And you can see the factorial of 4 is 24. So we are getting the correct output. So let me press any key. So this is it guys. This is how we write the program and execute it to find the factorial of a given number. I hope you like the video. If you have any doubts, you can post them in the comment section. I will be very happy to clarify those doubts. Thank you and happy learning. See you guys in the next video. Thank you. The topic is printing the Fibonacci series using the C language program syntax. We will be looking at the easiest way of printing the Fibonacci series. Before starting the video, I would like to request you people to please like and share our videos with your friends and family and also subscribe to our channel Codus Arcade and press the bell icon so that you receive notifications regarding our latest updates and you do not miss out on our future uploads. Thank you. So let's get started. So let us know more about the Fibonacci series. What is the Fibonacci series actually? The term Fibonacci comes from the name of an Italian mathematician named Leonardo of Pisa who was also known as Fibonacci. He was the one who introduced Fibonacci series to the world. Let's understand what is Fibonacci series. In the Fibonacci series, the next term is obtained by adding the previous two terms. For example, let us start the Fibonacci series. The first term is 0. The second term is 1. Now, for the third term, if we add these subsequent values, then 0 plus 1 is equal to 1. So, this will become the third value. Again, for the fourth term, we add the second and the third term. So, 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. Similarly, for the fifth term, we add the third and the fourth term. That is, 1 plus 2 is equal to 3. Again, for the sixth term, 2 plus 3 is equal to 5. Therefore, the series will go on like this. 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13 and so on. Now, let's see 
how we can write the C program to implement the logic and print the Fibonacci series. Generally, the question or the scenario is like this. Write a C program to print first n elements in the Fibonacci series. So let's quickly go to the editor so that I can show you how to write the C program and then explain the execution. Now as you can see I am inside my editor. So let's start by including the header file. Then I will start with the main function and inside the main function let me declare or initialize my variables. So in data type. So for the number of elements I will be taking the variable to be n and then I will take three more variables. The first one will be a where I will initialize the value to be 0 and then the second one will be b which will be the next term which is 1. Then I will also take another temporary variable so that I can store the other values or the corresponding values. So let it be c and finally I have to take one loop variable i so that I can iterate while using the for loop. So now I will use the print statement and here I will ask the user to enter the value of n or the limit. So in order to read the input from the user I will use the scanf percent d address of n so that I can store it in my variable n. Now let me print the series statement. So here I will be using this the Fibonacci series for person d elements is slash n and then here for the person d I have to call my variable n and now let me write the logic of the program. So for that I will be using the for loop and here I will use the loop variable which I have already declared which is i. So it will start from the initial value which is 1 and it will go on till the value of n or the element value which is provided by the user. So in that case i less than equal to n. So I did not give the semicolon let me provide it and now I will use the increment i plus plus. So inside the for loop our first task is to print the value of a which is 0. So I will use the print statement and then I will simply print person d slash n and then I will print my variable a. So as you can see here the value of a is 0. So it will automatically print the first value in the output to be 0. So after the semicolon. Now let me show you how the output will look like. So first the value of a will be printed. We can see that the initial value of a is 0. So in the output a will be printed which is 0. Now the first operation that is performed is the values of a and b are added and the result is stored in c. So after printing 0 what we need to do is the value of b has to be stored in a and then the value of c has to be stored in b. So for that what I will do is I will write a is equal to b and then I will write b is equal to c. But before that I told you one thing the values of a and b have to be added and the result has to be stored in c again and again. So what I will do is I will write c is equal to a plus b. So this process will go on and therefore we have this for loop. So let me now tell you the logic behind this so that you can understand. So you can see in the screen that a equal to 0 and b equal to 1. So c will be equal to a plus b which is 0 plus 1 is equal to 1. So output is 0 for the first time and then the updated values have to be assigned to a and b. So now a will become 1 and b will also become 1. Now in the next iteration a plus b will be is equal to 2. Therefore the value of c will be 2. 
and in the output we will be getting the a value because only the a value has been printed so in the next term in the output the value of a will be 1 again we have to update the values of a and b therefore a will be 1 now and b will be 2 therefore again 1 plus 2 and you can see the value of c becomes 3 now and in the output this value of a will be there so the third element is 1 0 1 then 1 now again the values of a and b will be updated which will be 2 and 3 then 2 plus 3 is equal to 5 so c will be 5 now now again the values of a and b will be updated a will be 3 and b will be 5 and then in the output we will be getting the next element which will be 2 and then the values of a and b will be again updated you can see here the value of a will be 3 and the value of b will be 5 and then the value of c will be a plus b which is 3 plus 5 equal to 8 then this 3 value of a will be printed in the output so this is the next element 3 and then it will go on and again we will have a plus b which is a equal to 5 and b equal to 8 and then we will get c equal to 13 so just because we have taken the value of n equal to 5 so in this case our output is complete and we will be getting the Fibonacci series as 0, 1, 1, 2 and 3. If we have more numbers then depending on the same logic it will go on and print the other numbers. So let us now check whether this program is working or not. For that let me run it for you so that I can show you the output. So I am running it. So here you can see, let me zoom it for you. It's asking me for the value of an order limit. Let me give it to be 5 and press enter. So you can see the Fibonacci series for 5 elements is 0, 1, 1, 2 and 3. So our program is working perfectly and it is giving us the correct output. So this is the entire logic of the Fibonacci series. I hope you have understood. So this is the entire program of how to implement the Fibonacci series. I hope you have understood properly how to implement it. If you have any doubts regarding this, you can post them in the comment section. I will definitely try to clear those doubts. Hello everyone. Welcome to our channel Code Sakhir. In this video, we are going to talk about structures in C. We are going to see what is structures, why do we use structures, and where do we use it. Structures are nothing but a user-defined data types. Using structures, we can define data type which can hold more than one element of different type. So structures are nothing but a user-defined data type. Like uh, unlike primitive data types such as int and user-defined data types, it's a collection of more than one words. Okay, and using structures, we can define data types which can hold more than one elements of different data types. Let's see our syntax to get more clarity on this. So for the syntax, struct is the keyword we must use while defining the structures followed by the identity of the structure. You can give any name to your structure. Then inside our structure, we'll define our multiple elements followed by their corresponding data types like data type element one, data type 
element two and data type element three and so on. At the end, it, it is a must to put in semicolon. Remember it. So now let, let us see an example to get a more clarity on this. We're going to create a structure of an employee. So we're going to create struct employee. And in our structure, we are going to give employee number, which is int employee number, character, employee name, and float employee salary. Here, we created a structure of an employee. In our structure, we have our employee number, which has a data type of int, employee name, which has data type of a character, and employee salary, which has a data type of float. So here you can see, we have a collection of more than one elements of different data types inside our structure. So, why do we use structures? So, unlike the array, which holds n number of elements of similar data type, like they have to be in homogeneous in nature. So, an array can't store a student data type or an employee data type or so on. So, for that purpose, we have our structures. You can't create a student data type or an employee data type using any other thing but structures. Now let us see how do we declare our structure inside our main function. We declare structure Inside our main function, here we defined our structure, struct employee, and inside our main function, we are going to declare our structures. For declaring, we are going to give our data type, which is struct emp. It's two words, okay? This is our data type, and e. This is how we declare our structure. Here E is nothing but an internal pointer variable. What does it do? It points towards the base address of our memory location. Let's start with an any random address, 2046. This is how it is going to store in our memory, or this is how it is going to get a memory allocation. We are starting from any random address. E, which is our internal pointer variable, will point towards the, this, the base address of our employee structure. Followed by E number occupies two bytes because it is of integer. So it goes 2048, then E name will occupy 20 bytes. So from 2048 to 2067, and employee salary will start from 2068. So in total, they will occupy 26 bytes of memory. Now let's see how do we print the size of our structure. First we'll start by defining our structure, struct employee and e number char e name and float e salary then 
inside our main function, we are going to declare our structure, struct employee e, and then we are going to print printf size of employee format followed by a format specifier. We are going to use a function size of and here we are using a function size of In, inside this function we can either use our internal pointer variable e or print f size of employee followed by a format specifier size of or struct emp a user defined data type they both are going to give you the same answer which is the size of our structures now let us see what are global structures and what are local structures so as the name suggests a local structure is a structure which is defined inside a function or a method so it cannot be accessed outside that function okay and a global structure is a structure which is defined outside a function so that it can be accessed globally anywhere for example let's give our function this is our main function and this is our check function maybe so if we create a structure inside our main function and let's give only two variables in a and b so this structure we have de defined inside a function or a method so it can't be accessed outside this function if we try to define it here struct local l it will say error because the structure is defined inside this function but in case of a global structure we can declare it anywhere this is correct this is correct but this is wrong now let us see how do we give an input to our structure we start by creating our structure struct employee and e number char e name and float e salary now inside our main function void mean And to define our structure, struct m e is equals to one zero zero one Rahul This is how we give an input to a structure. The order of the input should be seen like first the e number then the employee name and then the employee salary and we know that the character 
should be always in double quotation, no matter what programming language it is. Finally, we are going to print tails and print f. percentage t e percentage s and percentage t sal and this is how we are going to get the output like employee name followed by the format specifier and e dot e number then employee name followed by the format specifier which is percentage s and e dot e name and employee salary format followed by the format specifier and e dot e salary it's your choice how do you want to print it. We are going to talk about pointers in C. So, pointers in C. So, the first thing that comes into our mind is what is pointers? So, pointer is nothing but a variable whose value is the address to another variable. That is the direct address of a memory location. Or you can say this the pointer is used to access some information from a particular memory location. Let's start by seeing its syntax. So, you guys already know how to declare a normal variable, right? So, what is the syntax for declaring a normal variable? The syntax for that is data type and then the identifier, right? This is the syntax of declaring a normal variable, right? So, that example for this is, suppose we are declaring a variable int n. Suppose int n is the variable. This is how we declare a variable, normal variable, right? Now, to convert this normal variable into a pointer, how we can do that? Let us see. After the data type, if I add a star here, right here, here also, the syntax as well, the example of the syntax, this is how a pointer looks like. Now, this normal declaration of variable is converted into declaration of a pointer. So, this is how a pointer is written. The other form of declaring a pointer is int star n. So, either you can put a star just after your data type here or you can just add a star just before your variable's name. So, these are the two types uh, you can declare a, a pointer, right? So, in this case, this is the syntax of a pointer. So, it is, a, it is very simple, just data type, then star, then your identifier or your name of your variable, whatever it is. So, now let's see the different types of pointers. So, there are only two types of pointers. There are only two types. First type is, I'll write here, typed pointer and the second one is untyped pointer. Now, what is the difference between typed and untyped pointer? Let me explain you. Here, in the typed pointer, this typed pointer points to a specific type of data. What does this mean? Example for this is this typed pointers 
points to a specific type of data that means let's say int kind of data will only points to the int data got it float type of pointer will only specify to only points to float type of data now there is a structure data as well so suppose it is struct student pointer now this will only point to the student type of data or student day data so here type the pointer points to a specific type of data that is suppose if it is an int type of pointer it is it is only going to point towards the int data or it is if it is a float pointer then it is only going to point towards the float type of data and if it is a structural type of data or you can say structure pointer there is a structure pointer also so structure student pointer it is only going to points towards the student data here in this case now what is untyped pointer so untyped pointer can point to any kind of data so here typed data is only going to point towards that particular kind of data but untyped data under type untyped pointer sorry can uh, point towards any kind of data here this is also called generic pointer got it this is also called generic pointer just because it can point towards any kind of data example for this is void pointer void star it can point towards any type of data understood this difference there are two types of pointers first one is the typed pointer the second one is the untyped pointer typed pointer can only point towards a specific type of data that is suppose if it is an int type of data then it is going to only points towards the int data float type of pointer will only points towards the float data and struct type of pointer will only points towards that particular kind of data so struct student pointer will only point towards the student data now the point to remember here in typed data is that int type of pointer cannot points towards the float data or float kind of pointer will not be able to points towards the structural data or struct data cannot point towards the any other type of data only it only will be able to point towards that kind of data in untyped pointer it can point to any kind of data that means it is a generic pointer so it is also called a generic pointer example void pointer so void pointer can points towards any kind of data now whenever in pointers concept whenever we do any kind of operations we use only two types of operators the first one is the ampersand or the and operator or the address operator and the other one is the pointer operator so these are the only two operators that we use when we do the pointers so this is what we call address operator and this is the pointer operator so what does this address operator does suppose uh, this is the memory location okay so suppose we have declared something as i equals to 50 okay so this is i equals to 50 so when we declare this let's say int i equals to 50 so what is happening here computer will allocate a memory location with name as i and the value will be 50 and there will be some kind of address to this particular memory location let us say anything let's say 2160 so this 2160 is the address of this particular box this particular memory location so this is 
the address of this particular memory location. So if we use ampersand i or and i and if we print and i then it is going to return this value 2160. This is the address of the of this particular memory location which name is i. So we have allocated i equals to 50. So 50 is inside this memory location but the address of this memory location is 2160. So this is what we call the address of the memory location and ampersand or you can say address operator is used to get the address of this particular memory location. But he, what is this pointer operation? If this pointer operate, operator will points towards the value of this particular memory address. So if I write here pointer i, if I print pointer i then what will happen in this case this is going to return this is going to return from i equals to 50 this is going to return the value 50 why because it is pointing towards this address of this particular variable so point this pointer operator will give us the value 50 why because it is pointing towards this the address of this value this variable and it is going to print the value which is inside this particular memory address. So 50 is the value of this particular address. So it is going to print 50 here. So this is the main difference between the address operator and the pointer operator. So I hope you have understood this very well. Now let's see an example and understand pointer concepts little better. Now let's see the example for this. So suppose I'm going to write if program we have void main and inside a void main I am going to declare a variable. So let's say int let's say i equals to 50 let's say. When I declare a variable computer will allocate one memory here. So the name of this memory will be i the value of i is 50 so here the value will be 50 in this box and there will be some memory address for this particular memory location. So let's take anything suppose 2016 suppose 2016 is the address of this particular memory location for this declaration for i equals to 50. Now I am going to declare a pointer so let's say int star now I can use anything for that pointer's name. So in this case, I'm going to write here PTR semicolon everywhere. Now you can see I have declared a pointer. So here in this case, computer will again make a memory location for this PTR. And there will be again some address for this particular memory location, right? So let's say um, 3016. 3016 is the address of this PTR memory location. Right now we don't have anything into this PTR. So let's put something into it. Let's say PTR equals to ampersand of i or I have written and of i. And of i that means this is the address operator and I'm using i in this case. So what this PTR will contain here the value of PTR will be the address of this i. Why? Because I have written PTR equals to address of i. Right? So the value of this PTR will be 2016. So inside this 2016 will be the value of this PTR. And this 2016 is stored under this particular address of the memory location. So 3016. Now with this this pointer is pointing towards this memory location of i. After this, why? Because I have given the value as of PTR as ampersand i. So now this PTR is pointing towards this address of i which is 50, right? Just because I have given the value of PTR to be address of i. Now this pointer is pointing towards the address of this particular memory location of variable i. Now I'm going to print here some things. 
let's say print f percent d first i am going to print let's say i okay so with this percent d i what will be printed here the value of i which is 50 right this is going to print 50 now i'm going to print here print f percent d ptr let's say ptr so what is the value of ptr here 2016 which is the memory address of this memory location right so this statement will print the value of ptr which is 2016 2016 again after this i'm going to print some things print f percent d now i'm going to print the address of this i so what is the address of i here again 2016 address of this particular memory location 2016 again now again i'm going to print the address of ptr let's say what will be the address of PTR? Address of PTR will be 3016, right? Because this is the PTR value 2016. What is the address of this PTR? Address of this PTR is this 3016. So 3016. Now let's again print print f percent %d now let's print pointer of ptr now what is this pointer of ptr how what will be the value from for this pointer of ptr pointer of ptr will be 50 why see pointer of ptr pointer of this ptr that means what is the pointer of this ptr pointer means the value which is stored inside this ptr which is 2064 right and it is pointing towards this address which is i's address right so 2016 in 2016 what is written here 50 right so it is going to print 50 in this case i hope you have understood this one well pointer to ptr means pointer of the memory location of this pointer so the value of this pointer is 2016 this 2016 is pointing towards this memory location and what is the value of this memory location? The value of this memory location is 50, right? So 50 came here. Again, now I'm going to print percent %d and pointer of ampersand of i or the pointer of the address of i. So I've written pointer and i. So what will be the value of pointer and i? So first let's see the inside part and i. And i means the address of this i that is 2016. And what is the pointer of this 2016 pointer? That means the value which is stored inside this 2016 which is 50 again. So this is going to print 50 again and our program is completed. So this is a small example about pointers i hope you have understood this what we have done here is let me tell you first we have initialized a value of i as 50 so in the computer it created a memory location as 2016 or any location any address you can say 50 is the value of this particular memory location i now the address of this i is 2016 then we initialized a pointer int star ptr so when we initialize this pointer again for pointer it allocated a memory location as 3016 inside this 3016 it was empty till now till here till this point it was empty this is done this is done we are not done this so till here till this point this is empty right here ptr doesn't contain anything so it just allocated a memory location for ptr and the address for this memory location will be 3016 it can be anything we are just supposing 2016 and 3016 as for in for the example it could be anything we don't know 
So 3016 is the address of this PTR and 2016 is the address of this I. After this, this was empty. So we put ampersand I into this pointer. Ampersand I means the address of I. So what is the address of I 2016? So in the value of PTR will be 2016 in this one. Then we started printing our first thing. So we printed I, right? So the value of I is 50 in this case. So 50 is printed. Then again we printed pointer. So what is the value of this pointer? Just because the value of pointer was address of I. So address of I is 2016. So 2016 came inside this pointer. Now we came to this step and we printed address of I. So what is the address of I? Again address of I is 2016. So 2016 has been printed right here. After this, we printed ampersand PTR or and PTR or address of PTR. So what is the address of PTR here? 3016, right? So 3016 got printed here. Then we printed pointer to PTR. What does this pointer to PTR means? Pointer of this PTR. That means this pointer was containing 2016, right? Now 2016 is pointing towards this memory location. And what is the value of this memory location? 50, right? So it is going to print 50. Got it? Now in our final statement, we printed pointer of address of i, star of and of i, or you can say pointer of address of i. So in this case, what is the address of i? 2016 is the address of i, this variable right here. And what is the pointer? What is this pointing towards? This 2016 is pointing towards this value that is inside this memory location, which is 50. So again, 50 got printed. Right. So this is the example. And one more thing that is very important that you need to keep in mind is that we are using percentage D here in the print statement. Right. But whenever we are printing the address, the address will be in positive value only. We address cannot be negative value. These memory location, these addresses of this memory location cannot be in negative value. So it can't be negative of 2016 or negative of 3016. Address of this memory location should be only positive. But here we are using percentage D in our every print statement. Percentage D can return a negative and a positive value both. So in this case, whenever we are printing the address of the pointer, address of the memory location, we should always use percentage U percentage u here also percentage u so to make sure that our address will be always in positive value so what is this percentage u percentage u means unsigned value so percentage u means unsigned so this is going to only return the positive value for all the addresses right here In today's video, we are going to talk about preprocessor directives in C. So before starting this video, I would like to request you people to please like, share and subscribe to our channel Coders Arcade and press the bell icon so that you won't miss any future updates. So with this, let's continue our topic, which is preprocessor directive. So what do you mean by preprocessor? What do you mean by this word? Preprocessor is nothing but a program that preprocesses the source code. So this is our source code. Okay. So it preprocesses the source code before the source code is going to be compiled. So this is the compiler. Okay. So this is our source code. And before compilation, this preprocessor is going to pre-process the, uh, the source code. Okay. So this is our preprocessor, let's say. This is our preprocessor. So first the source code will go to the compiler and then this source code is first will pre-process by this preprocessor here. And then again this code will go back to the compiler. 
and then now this source code that is already pre-processed will compile now. Here in this case, uh, source code will not be compiled here, but after pre-processing only this source code will be get compiled. Then this code will be in the final form of assembly level language code. Assembly level language code. So preprocessor is nothing but a program that is used to preprocess the source code before compiling that particular source code. So in this case, you can say preprocessor is nothing but the text substitution, or you can say text processing tool. So basically preprocessor is nothing but the text substitution or text processing tool which is used to preprocess the source code before that source code is going to get compiled by the compiler. Now after it is compiled it is, uh, it is converted into the assembly level language code. So some basic example of preprocessor are the very basic example you always write hash include this hash include stdio.h before starting our C program. So this hash include stdio.h, this hash include is nothing but the preprocessor directive in this code. So this is what we call a preprocessor directive. So with this line, our source code will be first preprocessed and then it will be compiled afterwards and then it will be converted into assembly level language code. So now the points that you need to remember in preprocessor directives in C is that a preprocessor is not the part of compiler. It is not the part of the compiler, but it is not the part of the compiler, but it is the, first of all, it is not the part of the compiler, but it is the step in the compilation process got it so it is not the part of the compiler but it is the step in the compilation process that is very important because preprocessor first preprocesses the data the source code then it is gone to the compiler always preprocessor starts with a hash symbol right there so hash include stdio.h now there are so many hash defined we have hash include std lib.h hash include process.h or hash include math.h so there are so many preprocessor directives so this is the basic structure or this is the basic definition of preprocessor basically it is a program that is used to preprocess the source code before it that source code gets compiled by the compiler it is nothing but the text substitution or the text processing tool and it is not the part of the compiler, but it is one of the steps in the standard compilation process. Example for the uh, preprocessor directive is hash include stdio.h. So in this case, hash include is the preprocessor and preprocessor always starts with hash symbol. Now let us see different types of preprocessor directives. Actually, uh, there, are, there are totally 11 or 12 preprocessor directives that are that are important and you might be tackling those preprocessor directives many times. So let us see, here I will write uh, example, we have hash include, the most used one, everyone knows about hash include, then we have hash define, hash define, then we have hash if then we have hash else then we have hash l if then we have hash if def then we have hash undef we have hash end f end if then we have hash if and def then we have hash error, then we have pragma, hash pragma. So these are the 
important types of preprocessor directives that you are going to see in C programming. So these are the main preprocessor directives right here. Got it. Now preprocessor directives are of three types. So basically they are of three types. What are the three types? The first one is macro substitution. Directive, macro substitution directive is the first one, first type of preprocessor directive. And the second one is file inclusion directive, file inclusion directive. And the third one is the compiler control directive. So we have three types of preprocessor directives. The first one is the micro substitution directive. Then we have the file inclusion directive and then we have the compiler control directive. So this is all about preprocessor directive as an introduction. Now let us see these three types of preprocessor directive. So basically I'll give you an idea what preprocessor directive is. As you can see here on the board that preprocessor directive is nothing but a program that preprocesses your source code before it gets compiled by the compiler and then it is going to convert into assembly language code. Preprocessor is nothing but the text substitution or you can say text processing tool that is used to preprocess the source code. Now the main points that you need to remember while uh, preprocessor in, uh, in, in this topic preprocessor directives is that it is not the part of a compiler. It is different from the compiler but it is one of the steps in the compilation process in C language. Now, the example, the basic example for that is hash include std.h. Then uh, these are the important preprocessor directives that you will be tackling when in this topic. So we have we have hash include, hash define, hash if, hash else, hash elif, hash if def, hash undef, hash end if, hash f end def, hash error and hash pragma so basically hash include is used to include the files hash define is used to define the macros hash if is used to test the compilation time then um, hash else is just the alternative of hash if then hash elif is just the combination of f and else hash if and hash else in just one statement so that is hash elif then hash if def is the starting of the conditional statement, then this hash undef is the undefined. Uh, this is used to undefine the macro that is defined by this hash define. Uh, and uh, then hash end if is used to end the conditional statement, the conditional uh, the preprocessor. And then we have hash end if, and uh, this is used for the uh, again, this is used for the conditional statement. Then hash error is used to uh, print the error message. And hash pragma is used to, is as a special command in the compiler. And these are the three types of uh, preprocessor directives that we are going to discuss in this video again. So we have the ma macro substitution, then the file inclusions, uh, file inclusion directive, and then the compiler control directive. So these are the three. Now let us discuss about these three types of preprocessor directive one by one. So let us talk about the first type of uh, preprocessor directive, which is micro substitution directive. So what does this directive does? So macro substitution directive, what it does is it replaces, replaces every occurrence of identifier with predefined string. What do you mean by this? What do you mean by uh, replace every occurrence of uh, identifier with predefined string? So let me tell you, I'll explain you with the syntax. So the syntax here is hash define. To define a macro, we use hash define then the identifier and then the string or the predefined string. 
you can say that predefined strength. So the syntax for this is this. So what is happening here? Hash defined, we defined some identifier and we are using some predefined string that is going to replace this particular identifier. That means, let us see an example first. We have, let us say, I'm going to write here hash define. Let us say sum of x comma y will be replaced with x plus y. This is one of the examples. So now here what is happening? I have written hash define. So using hash define, I'm defining a macro and this is the identifier sum x comma y is replaced by x plus y. So wherever in our program, down in the program, wherever there is sum of x comma y, that will be replaced with x plus y. Let us see with the, uh, let us see this with an example. But before that, I'll give you one more example. Let us see another example hash define. Let us say I write s q r in capital and in bracket x. So this SQR x will be replaced by x into x. All right. So this is our first example and this is our second example. So now in this program, wherever SQR, capital SQR in bracket x will be there, that will be replaced with x into x. So we can use this to replace identifier with a predefined string. Now let us see and understand this logic with the help of an example program. So the example program. So first of all, we will start again with the hash include statement. So hash include stdio.h. Then I am going to define a macro. So to that, for that, we have hash define. And let us take the first example, sum of x comma y will be replaced with x plus y, right, x plus y. So there is one space here and one space here, okay. Now we will write our main function, so void main, inside our main function, I am going to declare a variable called s and using this s I am going to do this which is sum of now instead of x comma y I will give the values which is let us say 10 comma 20. So this is inside this s all right now in next step I am going to print it out so print f sum is percent d s what does this means and this is closed we closed our program so what we are doing here what will be the output for this program can you tell first i am starting with my preprocessor directive hash include and we included this file then we have defined a macro so hash define then sum of x comma y and this will be replaced with x plus y so in this case in our main function when i declared my first variable s and then i use that variable in this formula in this identifier that i'm using here so sum of 10 comma 20 here sum of x comma y so in this value of x is 10 and value of y is 20 so this will be automatically replaced by x plus y. So we don't have to write here in this part of the program, we don't have to write 10 plus 20 or x plus 20, x plus y. We don't have to write this. This is okay for us. So we don't have to write this. We don't need this. Okay. This is just fine. And then I'm just directly printing sum or sum is percent d and directly printing this s. So my output will be output for this program will be sum s. What will be the sum? The value of s will be 30. So this will be our output of this program. So using this macro, we 
don't have to write any formula just in this case i've used this identifier as sum of x comma y c x comma y is 10 comma 20 and it is automatically replaced with this logic but we are not writing this logic so we don't have to write this logic anymore we don't need this all right so there you go this is the program for macro substitution directive and this is our main point of focus so this is our program and this is our output so this is what we call macro substitution directive there we go so i hope you have understood this now let's move on to the other one which is file inclusion directive so now let us talk about our next one which is file inclusion directive so what do you mean by file inclusion directive as the name suggests this directive is used to include files so example for this is we already know hash include we write stdio.h right so this is an example so we are including the stdio.h file here now the main point to be remembered here in this file inclusion directive is there are two types of files that you can include using this file inclusion directive so there are two types of files that can be included okay so what are the two types of files the first header file you can say we always say header file or you can say standard file the main header or the standard file like the stdio.h the process.h or math.h the second one is user defined file so let us discuss about these two again so in this file inclusion directive we have it is used to include the files for example hash include we are including this stdio.h now there are two types of files that can be included using this file inclusion directive and the first one is the header of the standard file now this header of the standard file are the predefined files these are the predefined files what do you mean by predefined files i'll tell you but the second one is the user defined file so user defined files means it is user defined again it's user defined so what all this header of the standard file contains predefined files means such as files such as stdio.h we have this file then we have math.h then we have process.h then we have stdlib.h so many there are so many these are the header or the standard files these are the predefined files right these are the header on the standard the first one now the second one is the user defined files so what are user defined files so as you can see here user defined files so user defined files are nothing but uh, like you can say when you have a very large program when you when you have a very large program suppose around 200 to 300 lines of code good practice is that you should divide that program into small parts and then you can include those parts into your this user defined files so in this case you can say the syntax for user defined including user defined files is you can write like hash include hash include and after that hash include you can just write in double quotes your file name there you go so this is how you can include the user defined files so your own file or any user defined files so it can be any program file it can be any type of file but but it should not be the predefined file so predefined files such as these files if it's a predefined files then it is always written in arrows arrow brackets and if it's a user defined file it is al always written into written as double quotes like this and inside that 
your file name will be present. So now let's see the different syntax for writing header files and user defined files. So including header files and user defined files. So generally the syntax for header file is including header file is hash include and inside our arrow brackets your file name will be present. Here your file name will be present but for the user defined syntax will be hash include instead of using arrow brackets here in double quotes your file name will be present. So like this. So the syntax for including header files is hash include in arrow brackets file name and uh, for user defined files syntax for uh, including a user defined files is hash include in double quotes you will write file name. So this is all about file inclusion directive. Now let us understand this topic with the help of a example program. So let us see an example program. Example program for file inclusion directive. So let us see to include a basic file. We always start with hash include. These are the header files stdio.h okay now hash include stdio.h then I'll directly write my main function white main and inside my main function I will just print printf uh, let's say coders arcade coders arcade we are going to print coders arcade into our print statement and then we'll close our program. We'll close our main function and we completed this program. So can you tell me what is the output for this? What is the output for this? Output will be coders arcade. So here in this case, we are including this file stdio.h. What is this stdio.h? This stdio.h is nothing but standard input and output file. So standard input and output file what this means is this header file this stdio.h contains keywords such as printf, scanf, and many more. So this stdio.h is the standard input and output file and this file contains printf, scanf and many more keywords. So in this case if we don't include this stdio.h this printf will won't work and it will give us an error. This program won't execute without stdio.h. So there are different different files. So this is the predefined or you can say the standard header file that we included in our program. So this is the main reason that is why this is the main reason we include these kind of files all right to support these keywords and support different part of your program. Now um, there are so many files so many types of files that you can include in a header file as I have told you before stdio.h is one math.h is another process dot h is another stdlib dot h is another so these are the various different files that you can use to include according to your program requirement so these are the standard header files all right so with this we have completed our second type of uh, preprocessor directive which is file inclusion directive so our main point of focus in this one is this hash include stdio.h. So hash include this is our file inclusion directive right here. So hash include is the main file inclusion directive. Now let's move on to our next one and the final one which is compiler control directive. So now let us see that. So now let's talk about compiler control directive. This is the third type of preprocessor directive that we have in C 
एंड वाई वट इज दिस यूज फॉर सो बेसिकली कंपाइलर कंट्रोल डायरेक्टिव इज यूज to partially to select some particular part of a program and then compile it you can use this directive to compile some specific part of a program or you can skip the compilation of some specific part of a program according to your requirement of the program so let us see the syntax for that or first let us see the directives which use which are used in this compiler control directive so directives such as hash if all the condition directive conditional directives so hash if hash else hash uh, if def hash if and def hash undef hash and if and if all these kinds of directives are included into this compiler control directive so let us see the syntax for this kind of directive so i will use if def here so hash i will start my program by hash if def then here comes our macro name so macro name inside our program there will be many statements statement 1 then statement 2 then statement 3 and so on till statement n and then we will end our program so by using this end if because we started if def and now we'll end it using and if directive you will understand this kind of directive properly when i'll show you the program for this so basically compiler control directive is used to partially compile your program or select a particular part of a program you can compile that part of a program or you can select what part of your program you don't want to compile and then you will proceed according to your program requirement so in this case we have all these directives for the compiler control directive and this is the syntax for this compiler control directive program now let's jump directly into the example program and understand better about compiler control directive so now let's see the example program for this compiler control directive so as usual i will start my program with hash include what you might know now stdio.h then i will define a macro so hash define uh let's say my macro name will be line okay line and i'll replace this with one you will get to know why i'm doing this now we'll create our main function void main and inside our main function i will start my hash if def if def line what does this mean by if def line we'll see i'm first i am starting with if def line and then if line line means if now this macro will swap line with this one so if one then print print f the line is one else hash else i'm using else hash else directive hash else print f the line is 2 okay then i will just end it so how i'll end it hash end if and i'll close my main function so here is the example program now let's dive 
a little bit deep and see what's going uh, what's happening here so this is our hash include std io.h we are including this so that we can access printf function right here and uh, that this is very important so it's the standard input output file then i've defined the macro so line and one so line will be swapped line in this whole program will be swapped with one so in our main function if def line if def line means line will be swapped with one so here in this case the value of line this will not be there i mean to say is instead of line just because we are using uh, hash de hash define line one instead of line it will be swapped with one and then in printf if it is one then it will say the line is one if it's not one then else printf the line is two and then end if so what is happening here here if def line value is will be one so this will line this line will be swapped with one so since it is one then output what will be the output output of this program what is the output of this program output of this program will be the line is one so the line is one will be printed into your terminal why this is printed because here in this case we swapped the line with one we swapped this identifier line with this predefined string which is one correct so this will be printed this will be executed but this won't be compiled this will be compiled but this won't be compiled why because our condition is true in this case only so it will skip the part and it will end the if def like that and with this our this line is one will be printed here in this case so with this we have come to an end with our topic preprocessor directives in C programming. So we discussed about preprocessor directives. We discussed about what are what are the preprocessor directives. We discussed about how they work. What is a preprocessor directive, and uh, what are the types of preprocessor directives? So there are three types of preprocessor directive. The first one is the uh, macro substitution, and the second one is the file uh, file inclusion, and then the third one is the compiler control directive. So so this is all about this video guys i hope you have understood this if you have any doubts please tell them tell us in the comment section below and we will try to solve your doubts as quickly as possible and if you like this video please like share and subscribe to our channel coders arcade and press the bell icon so that you won't miss any future updates and uh, thanks for watching this is ashang david signing off happy learning